Welcome to Have Movies Will Game, the only podcast on the globe where we take you, our friendly listener, to the best and worst movies of yesterday and today, and then discuss ways that you can play them at your gaming table. But the fun doesn't stop there, no sorry. Every few episodes, our intrepid hosts, Matthew, Dusty, and Nathaniel, will ask you, the listener, to vote on which movie they will play as an RPG, recorded in video and in glorious black and white, and brought to you through the electronic wonder of the internet. Now, let's start the show! Hi everybody, I'm Matthew. And I'm Dusty. And I'm Nathaniel, and we have with us today a very special guest. I'm Scott. Welcome, Scott. Thank uh, you. By the by, everyone, if this is your first time tuning in, here's what we're doing. Every week, we take a different movie, we break it down in detail, and then we find ways for you to bring it to your gaming table. Now, fair warning, if you haven't seen the movie, there will be spoilers. We highly recommend that you pause this and then go watch the movie. We'll be right here when you come back. Now, this movie that we're doing this week is from 1974. So, 73. Well, iTunes said 74. No, it's set in 1973. I'm sorry. pretty sure it said that about the sequel, though. Wasn't that 1974? Yeah, wasn't this one cut up? Dusty? Yes. It, <laughs> this, it, this one was filmed two films concurrently and then cut into two films. So Scott was brought here. Uh, Scott is one of my oldest friends here in the city of Portland, and we game together all the time. Scott is one of those people that whenever I put together a new campaign that I'm thinking about running, one of the first questions I ask myself is, can I pitch this to Scott and will Scott play in it? Usually the answer <laughs> is yes. Yeah. But I also know that Scott, from the many times that I've been over to his house, loves the Three Musketeers, has so much memorabilia, brought books with them tell us scott why do you like this movie so much uh well i like the book and the, this movie this particular version of the movie follows the book very closely Excellent. um so that's that's kind of why I, like. I mean this is also like i mean it's an all-star cast from the 70s it's it's really hard i mean you you've watched the movie it's really hard not to like the movie <laughs> yeah um, a lot of fun uh you know versus the other musketeers that have come out since this one um you know with the the Kiefer Sutherland version, or the most recent, most <laughs> recent Disney. one with the flying ship. I would. I don't. I don't. I didn't mean to see that one. It's it's hard to pick between Charlton Heston and uh, Tim, Curry? Tim Curry. Tim Curry. They yeah. both bring a different charm. I love Tim Curry. So do I. Tim Curry was the source of me ever doing drag in the first place, thanks to that movie, <laughs> which we might do sometime. <laughs> I, but, I don't think you're not you're alone in that. No, probably but uh, not. honestly, I thought this movie was amazing. It had like this certain innocence about it, which I think is really missing from modern cinema. I mean, it, I mean, th it wasn't amazing cinematography. There was no incredible explosions, but every part of the acting in this movie was just it was joyful, and, it, and it, I love it. it. It was good, and there was some some corn factor to it, which was also nice. Oh yeah, yeah. It, it did follow the book. I mean, we all know the story of Three Musketeers. I've never read the books. Yeah, oh. so everyone Savage. says we. Uh, Everyone thinks, oh, well, we all know the story of the Three Musketeers, but everyone's just remembering the movies. I don't know if they've ever, like, read the books. Um, but I, books, lots of books. There's actually um, the original Three Musketeers. He wrote a, a sequel, so to speak, uh, called 20 Years After, which takes place probably 20 years after that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. and, a, and another one that's called 10 Years Later, which takes place 10 years later, later than that. And that's usually broken up into three to five books, depending upon the publisher, because it's really lengthy. Hmm tome well if you haven't read the book you should probably go out and get a copy of it and read it but the but this movie the movie was based on the novel of the same name by alexander dumas and every generation has its own adaptation of the movie following this 1973 version uh 1921 saw the douglas fairbanks version 1990 1939 excuse me uh the story became a stage musical with don amici and in 1948, an all-star cast brought the story to life again. Uh, and this version is no different. But what makes this version different is the comedy aspect. Yeah, it, definitely. Which definitely holds out throughout the entire movie, I think. Yes, and that is that is pretty much in part to the director, Richard Lester, mm -hmm. and the writer, George McDonald Fraser, who is an amazing comedic writer. I saw that. Yes, he he was very good with that. Uh, what else? What else has he written? He wrote. Wise? He wrote a series. He's written. He's still alive, I believe. He's written a series of novels called the Flashman novels, which take place in the Napoleonic era, and with the with Flashman being the protagonist, this hero uh, who's like an incompetent hero. Okay, he like blunders along into 
victory all the time. Kind of like Cabin Boy. Or D'Artagnan himself in this movie. He's more more like (laughs) D'Artagnan, yeah. Yeah. He was fairly capable in his own way, though. He was, but... In his own way. Some of that was unintentional. (laughs) Yeah, he's really an excellent swordsman, which they, which in the movie you see in the first time that he, they fight together. So the cast, I actually really, really like. I mean, my, I prefer, honestly, I know you're probably going to hate me, Scott. I prefer the, the one that was done in the 90s with Tim Curry. That's oh, my favorite no, uh, no, Three no, Musketeers, no, no. just no, because no. of the cast. But this cast is really amazing. You have Oliver Reed, who plays Athos, which, in my mind, he should have played Porthos. Wh- uh, why? Why? Because Oliver Reed himself is like the living embodiment of excess and fun. So a little bit, a couple stories. No, he's known for his massive fun binge drinking, which I kind of <laughs> align to Porthos. <laughs> Oliver Reed has a story that circulated for a while that he and 36 of his friends went drinking one evening and imbibed, imbibed 30, oh, sorry, 60 gallons of beer, 32 bottles of scotch, 17 bottles of gin, wait, four wait, crates wait, of how wine. How many friends? 36. Four okay. crates of wine and a bottle of baby sham, which in 1957, was marketed as genuine champagne Perry. All right. I'm pretty sure that's got to be some hyperbole in there. Probably. He later revised a lot of dead people. He later revised the story claiming the event was a two-day binge before marrying Joseph Burge. Yeah. So that (laughs) clearly puts Oliver Reed himself as chaotic neutral. (laughs) So, (laughs) yeah. And, you know, if, if, uh, if some of his friends were, say, like Richard Harris and Peter O'Toole, very, very notorious drunks drinkers, of the time, yes. drinkers of the time. God bless you know, Peter lots of O'Toole. English actors out there were like that. You know, Robert Shaw, nor- notoriously mm-hmm. drunk on the set of Jaws well, yeah, all the time. Yeah, the concept, I can see that. He would yeah. have made a better Porthos. He would have made a much better Porthos. He played a great Athos, I, though. Yeah, that really being did. said, he did an amazing he job. Did. Yeah, and, and that made me question all of the other portrayals of Athos that I had yeah. actually seen, including in the television show. He's, yeah. Yeah. he's most well-known in our generation, for playing uh, Proximo in Gladiator with Russell Crowe. Yes. So you know, a lot of people don't know who uh, he is, but in our generation, that's who he's... I don't know. He, he does for. serious well. And honestly, from doing sword and board for like four years, his sword play was probably the best out of all of them. The, the most real. Oh, yes. Yeah. I most certainly do. Oh, interesting. Yeah. So Athos, mm-hmm. what would you say then portraying him as a character, his alignment style, how would you go? I'd say neutral. Neutral? Yeah. Not neutral good? Okay, neutral good. I'd say he's chaotic good myself. Really? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I mean, he's he's moody, but he's not bad. He's he's definitely a good aligned character. Yeah, I'm going to go neutral good. I want to say in the books, he's much more lawful. Like, he's he's like, he, he follows the rule because yeah. he's Athos, but he's also the Count de la Fere. Yeah. So he's Erosino. Has he's, anyone he's else here read the book besides... All right. I okay. think I'm yeah. the only one who has not. Okay. <laughs> so. But I do have a question, actually. Back in high school. Go ahead. Carrying forth on that. And mm-hmm. it's only because I've been in preparation for this, I've also been mm-hmm. kind of mainlining the TV show a second time. Yeah. In the book, does he have that same past relationship with uh, Melody? Yes, they were married. Okay. Yeah. So mm-hmm. that's canon. That, that's a mm-hmm. thing. Yeah, yeah, they were married. He wanted thing. to make sure and, that they didn't invent yeah. that for the show. No, that's no, a big okay. thing. They were yeah. married, and he, he thinks he killed her. Yeah, like he in the books, he hangs her from a tree and and leaves. Spoilers, but but she um, <laughs> but she survives and comes back. All right, Athos, neutral good. Who you got next? And then we have uh, Frank Finley, who played Porthos, <laughs> who was very obvious that they put like a stomach on him to play the part because yeah. a couple of times it, you could see it falling. Yeah, yeah, yeah. His it, waist. It, it did not move with him when he lunged. No. And it, being, there was and, no slosh. And, and being a bigger guy, that's easy to pick out and see. Oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, if if you look at the stills, like sometimes they'll have like a still, which is like all four of them together mm-hmm. doing a thing. Frank Finley's boots actually have like two-inch platforms on them. I noticed them. that. Yeah, I noticed that. I did He's not. a short guy. He's a short guy. Really? <laughs> so I'm, I'm ashamed. I have no idea who he was, uh, the actor. I've, mm-hmm. I don't. I did not recall him being in anything. Way what else well has he before, done? well well before our time, he did a lot of British st- the stage. Okay. Uh, I believe he also did. Uh, I actually had this written out, but I was like, oh no, this is going too deep into it. Uh, he did a lot of. He played Morley, Marley in a Christmas oh, that's Carol. Right. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, Jacob Marley in, the, in a Christmas oh, Carol. That was so good. That was like one of his big stage pieces. But he's done a lot of stage and a lot of of British 
films uh, as well. So he was pretty well known. Does he have any crazy drinking stories? No, no. I, I actually, everybody had like crazy stories, some kind of crazy story to go along with this, but that was like the biggest standout story. <laughs> I mean, even when we get down to like Christopher Lee and Charlton Heston, that was Oliver Reed kind of stands out of <laughs> among all of them. So that's, oh. uh, I'd say he was chaotic good as yeah, well. Yeah, I keep forgetting about this. <laughs> <laughs> no, you said you said that. Yeah, Por- or Porthos. Oh, Porthos. Oh, yeah, Porthos. Yeah, yeah. Chaotic uh, good. Yeah, yeah, he's yeah. chaotic good, definitely. Yeah. I agree with he's, that. Uh, yeah, I mean, yeah. Okay. He's, Carrying on. He's definitely good. I don't know. Chaotic. Neutral good, I'd go neutral. Definitely the, the not purloining, <laughs> the, the purloining of the purse in the beginning of, in the depiction in the movie. Yeah. Where, you know, he lifts the purse because of his hat. That's a that's a total chaotic good moment. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, Richard Chamberlain, who plays Aramis. He. Yeah. Uh, Richard Chamberlain oh did a lot. God. Did a lot of like made-for-TV movies yeah. back in in the seventies and eighties. But he also did the Alan Quartermain movies, which which are, are amazing, which are f- very very fun movies to watch. And I have an RPG for those specifically awesome. made for the Alan Quartermain <laughs> stories. Uh, what do you think his alignment would be? Aramis. Yeah, I mean he is the priest, the philandering priest. I yeah. might add. <laughs> <laughs> Chaotic good. Chaotic good. Honestly, definitely. most of the party yeah. I, I feel falls into chaotic good. Yeah, this yeah. is definitely you know all for one, one for all. Mm-hmm. Hoorah! Chaotic good. Yeah, Scott. Though uh, I have to say, he was a little foppish. Well, that's what he is. You know, he he looks he looks good for the ladies. Yeah. In the movie, chaotic good's good. Uh, I'm going for neutral based on my ideas out of the books because he's in in the books he's actually the least honorable of the uh, four characters. Really, the one who wants to be a priest. Yes. This movie wasn't kind to religion in general. No, no. that's true. Yeah. <laughs> this, this this was not a glowing recommendation of religion. We then have Michael York, who plays D'Artagnan. Fan-freaking-tastic, by the way. Those baby blue eyes and the sincerity just radiating off of his stupid face yeah. was fantastic. <laughs> I could not unsee Logan. Yeah, that's true. Yeah, because yeah. he, he, he did play in Logan's run. And then for our generation, he was also in the Austin I, Powers movies. I caught this movie first before I saw Logan's Run no, growing I see, up. I, I saw this Logan's is Run this first. is who he is in my own personal head canon. And for this one, I'm going to go away from chaotic good. He is lawful good throughout this entire movie. Every moment where his honor is challenged, he steps up. He plays by the rules every time. He, he plays by the rules by trying to get into a married woman's pants. Yeah, and he throws himself out the window. That's while musketeer he's... rules. <laughs> you, have to, you have to remember, this is also France. No, this is true. This is okay. And this Still. is uh, the, the French nobility. He is entirely playing by the rules. There is nothing wrong with a mistress I would, in I a would, French court. I would say balance between lawful and chaotic. Madness. Neutral good. I'm going. I can go either way. He's He does some pretty insane things. Like when he's meeting with the head of the musketeers to join, and he just like he just sees somebody out the window and he jumps out. But you know that might that's not actually he was challenged. I well, that could be. I think that's less of a question of alignment and more again back to what we were talking about with in sneakers. It's not his alignment. That's more of a character trait of attention deficit hyperactivity <laughs> disorder. <laughs> so I can see him as lawful good ADD. Well, you know and how they always say it's it's. Uh, it's lawful good, not lawful stupid. I yeah. think in this particular case, that may not hold true. <laughs> they, they might actually, it actually might actually be like lawful Gascon. Because in, yeah. yeah. in, the, in, the, in the books, they're, they, they're like, oh, he's do, oh, the hot headed Gascon. It's, it's like a, that, that's an a archetype. regional trait yeah. that they put, yeah, that they put out. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, it, it was, it was amazing. And honestly, back, back to the acting and less from the, from that. It, just an amazing job. Oh, he did. And then we have the uh, the great Christopher Lee as Rochefort. Sadly, evil. sadly the <laughs> late, great Christopher yeah, Lee. Yeah, this is oh, true. God, don't remind me. Yeah. No, I yeah, mean, lawful I evil. Yeah, lawful evil. Lawful this... neutral. I'm with him. <laughs> I'm with Scott. He was willing to... Actually, wait. Oh, my God. You're right. Yeah. He never actually did anything dastardly. No, he did not. Because at the very beginning of the movie... He really could have fucked D'Artagnan up, right? And he was just, get away, away, yeah. away, you're bothering me. Everything Put that he did was under orders. Horse. Yeah. And his henchmen ripped him off, not him. Yeah. Oh, no. They gave the money back, didn't yeah. they? He's, yeah. He's, yeah, they threw I, it I agree him. with Scott. He's, okay. he's lawful Actually, yeah, neutral. I'll go with that. I, I, I officially recant. Yeah, lawful neutral. And then we have the also late, great Charlton Heston. Oh. 
who yeah. played yeah. Cardinal Richelieu. Did he die this year or last year? No, it was a few I'm going years to ago. say Lawful Neutral as well. No, Lawful he was, Evil. He was a game player. No, he was a selfish. He, he, that, selfish doesn't mean evil. If, if, I know that last time Dusty was pulling up those textbook uh, <laughs> descriptions of the alignments, <laughs> but I would definitely put Richelieu as Lawful Evil. Hmm. You also say Darth Vader is lawful evil. Well, Darth Vader is absolutely lawful evil. I don't see those two as being equal. Darth Vader is willing to torture and do awful things in order to pursue the law. That's where the line is crossed. Mm. I'm almost with lawful neutral, but I'm going to go with lawful evil. For, I'm, for I'm, the I'm, sole <laughs> reason that there is a torture chamber scene in yeah. the movie. I can't look at that with modern values. I have to. No. No, no, no. I look at it with the values that the role-playing game was written, and those are modern values where torture's bad. As a player, I try and put myself in the time, and more importantly, the time's morality. I would not say lawful evil. But that's just me. I am totally fine with being the only one on that. I have been before. I'd say that the king was lawful neutral, definitely. He was lawful bored. I say that was chaotic (laughs) neutral. That guy was lawful fucking... (laughs) But Richelieu, he, he had an evil streak to him. I think Tim Curry did a better job of and, and, that Wait, wait, wait. wait. An, an evil streak, you say? Yeah. So you'd say he had some evil in him, but some not evil? Just a streak. That wouldn't be his main a streak overriding character? Well, again, these are nine alignments. <laughs> I think he <laughs> no. could be somewhere between <laughs> neutral okay. and evil. All right, all right. All right. Yeah, and we're, after we're... that, after, after Charlton Heston, we have Raquel <laughs> Welch. Those. Playing Constance, who oh, actually Raquel she, Welch won, Constance. she won a Golden Globe for Best Actress for this movie. I think just neutral. Ne- She's just neutral, if not neutral, good. Yeah, neutral she seemed good. to have a good heart. Yeah, yeah, neutral, good. Got she it. there's she not an alignment to... that says clumsy as all hell. So. <laughs> Again, bad character trait. She's she got a want, flaw. She wants to do good for her queen. Mm-hmm. She's you know not necessarily for her husband, but. <laughs> And then after uh, Mr. Kel Welch, we have Simon Ward, who played the Duke of Buckingham. He was amazing. Yeah. Uh, he yeah. Did a very Simon good job. Ward was a very good I think he very stole every scene he was in. All this, three of them for that mm-hmm. pick. Uh, Faye Dunaway for Milady de Winter. Oh, Milady de Winter. Yeah. What is it about evil girls that just. <laughs> Lawful evil, definitely. She, she is neutral evil. Neutral? She, oh, are, she are, are, you ta- everything. Are, are you taking that? From this movie specifically, or from the follow-up movie and the book, because more, this more movie from, specifically, more from the follow-up movie as well. Which, I, since since they were films at the same time as right, one movie, right. I keep them as a, as a single film okay. in my head. I've never we'll, before seen we'll a movie that. that had an advertisement at the end for the sequel. We it was will actually get to that. Yeah, I mean, that was the music, that. and then rounding out the wait, entire. Wait, wait, wait. As, as far as her alignment, were uh, you in concurrence? I can go with neutral evil. Yeah, yeah. I'm I'm, I'm going to say chaotic neutral for her. In hmm? this no. release of this first half of the movie. Second and half, you're entirely right, Scott. Yeah. Go ahead, Dusty. And then rounding out, we have Roy Kinnear, who played Planchet. Uh, who, he was who wonderful. Was the valet to <laughs> it's actually, Canyon. it's pronounced Planchet. Oh, yeah. it is? Okay. Planchet. Okay. In the France. You. In the France. He's All not right. a person. He's just a servant. <laughs> <laughs> oh, get on, then. <laughs> yeah, he had some really, really good comedic bits uh, for his part, kind of just off to the side that I really, really This liked. was half... Like uh, the the Errol Flynn Robin Hood and half mm-hmm. uh, Three Stooges. It was fantastic physical comedy throughout. It was great. But also fantastic like fight court choreography. Yes, that word. That's, that, Certainly. That, that correct yeah. word, choreography. <laughs> so the movie was actually filmed between May of 1973 and November of 73, and it was released in December. Now, the production cost... On the Three Musketeers. Wait, wait. It was filmed between when and when? May and November of 1973. That's so not The production long. ended in November. And, and was it was released, released in, in December. December. Wow. The production cost on the Three Musketeers then was just a little over $10 million. So in today's market, that's a little over $55 million. So much of that must have been costuming. It wasn't yeah, set. It, it wasn't was. location. A bit for the actors, but... There was the a lot of overdubbing. Was spot on. There was a lot of voice overdubbing when they went. They went back into the studio and, to redo and the machinery, set design, mm-hmm. all those human-powered treadmills providing the nobles with entertainment. The artwork that uh, I that I did the mining on for this, like the costume design, yeah, yeah. it was just just beautiful. And I really wish there were times where I, I wish this was a video thing so we could slap up. Like some of the stills that that I, if found. you ask very nicely, Nathaniel <laughs> might put links in the link dump. Well, it's 
you know, I'm known to take bribes. <laughs> just just to let everyone know, like when everyone else is talking, I'm nodding my head in total agreement <laughs> with everything you're saying. It just doesn't come over very well on the microphone. The domestic return at the time was twenty two million. So it little more than doubled its production value. Okay. Today that would be uh hundred and twenty million dollars almost hundred and twenty one million for a returns, which is Dear God. not a bad run for a movie. And the rentals encompass just a little more than ten million in And in the, the ninety nine cents I just spent on it to watch it again. <laughs> wait, 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 I'm sorry. The rentals of the costumes or the rentals No, no, the rentals of the movie. The rentals of the movie. <laughs> like, the rentals of the million dollars <laughs> costume? I, 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 I would like to say that oh, wow. I as I wanna say eleven to 13-year-old Matthew mm-hmm. um, rented this movie, not from a blockbuster because we live too far out in the, st- in the sticks, but from our local video store easily 10 times. All right, so you had said something earlier about the split? Yeah. Uh, Scott and I were actually talking about that when we met up the other day, and it was something that I didn't really know. Um, so the movie from the get-go is long. It's like over three and a half hours. Initially, it was over three and a half hours with an intermission. That's too long. <laughs> that's getting borderline into like the ham Hamlet without any. That's some Tom Cruise level of masturbation. Well, they're wow. they're tr- the wow. idea was to to make an epic along the lines of say Lawrence Arabia or Ben Hur. Yeah. 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 Uh, uh, quick question, uh, Dusty. Yes. The budget you mentioned was mm-hmm. that for both parts or just the <laughs> first? The production team knew that they weren't going to make the cutoff date, so. It was edited into two completely different movies. The second being the continuation, which was The Four Musketeers. Now, as Scott and I were talking about, that was something that hadn't was not stated to the, the actors. They were under the impression that it was being filmed as one whole movie, and when they went to go see it, it was going to be one three-and-a-half-hour-long movie. But because they had to do the editing and they cut it, they got the cut that you see that we watched with the trailer. That was the first time they even knew... Oh, really? The cut. Hey, guys, guess what? Yeah. <laughs> at the premiere. Yeah, at the premiere. Oh, they, really? Yeah, that's when they found out about it being cut. So the actors at that point and the crew were a little more than surprised, and they were rightfully upset with that. They uh, they were paid for one movie, not two movies. I was just about to ask. Did they renegotiate their contract? Yeah, they did. So they basically, ultimately what happened was they did a buy one, get one free thing until they brought... You know they were going to bring it up for for litigation. The director he maintained his in- innocence, saying that he had never intended to make two movies, uh, but that in the in the editing process he realized that there was way too much shot for that one film. So instead of cutting it down and losing so many great scenes, he decided he'd rather chop the footage in half and make two films. That is a solid choice. Whenever possible, directors who are directing right now. Stop cutting everything down <laughs> to the bare bones. Just make another movie. So because of this kerfuffle that came about, about them not getting paid I'm for sorry, the second... Beca- because of the what? Kerfuffle. Could you say it slower for me? Kerfuffle. Yeah. You like That's that? going yeah. in the outtakes. <laughs> That's also going to be my ringtone. Kerfuffle. <laughs> so uh, because of that, what came about from that was, also, was, was named the Salkind Clause. And what the Salkin Clause stipulates is how many films are being made, and more to the point, it protects and guarantees that an, act, that an acting contract for one film can't be extended into two films without the consent and compensation of the actor. So this, this had not happened before. No, it had under... never happened before. Interesting. Or and, it, and the ahead, Salkin Scott. Clause is named after Alexander Salkin, yes. Yes, the producer. Yeah. Yes. Uh, it had never happened before, so when the entire crew and actors were up in arms that they weren't getting paid for two movies when they did one, right? they threatened to sue, and because of this, this little clause came about, and that's why in movies now, like if you see uh, the Harry Potter and the Deathly Hallows, that was one book turned into two movies, Yeah, this is a perfect example of that happening. They had to get paid for both parts of that one movie. It's a good thing, because I, a lot, I think a lot of actors would have you know, given a middle finger at that point. Weren't all of the Lord of the Rings movies basically just sort of filmed back to back? Yes, they were. Yeah. Wow. I, I think it was 18 months of straight filming, if I remember correctly, on those uh, production You didn't even notes. remember your kids' names after that point. <laughs> <laughs> that was w- one of the main reasons why Sean Connery didn't take Gandalf, because yeah. it was he was going to be gone for 18 months. Yeah, I'm so glad he didn't. 
Yeah, because it just would have been Sean Connery playing Gandalf. Yeah, no, that, uh, <laughs> that that's that's oh, for the next off. talk. Yeah, <laughs> yeah we got to, got to roll the Mordor. <laughs> Uh, so one of the things that I really liked about um, the characters was the really decent, if not very well done, choreography of the sword play. I really nope. liked so You didn't like any of it? I liked two scenes. Really? Yeah. Because there's a big name hitter in co- fight choreography for this movie. I thought it was all movie. amazing. It's I yeah. thought that was fantastic. Yeah. Movie fighting. Okay. So I saw one scene of real fighting. Matthew, I'm just... Disappointed. I have in you. fought light and I have fought sword. So have board. I. Yeah. But <laughs> I I'm, studied I'm fencing. Goddamn good at it. <laughs> <laughs> I thought Porthos was the worst fighter of the group. Oh, yes. yes. Yeah. He kept oh, grabbing yeah. his sword with two hands I, and kind of. I, I think with Oliver Porthos, Reed is Athos in that uh, that first fight scene. He wraps mm-hmm. yep, his cloak and yep. he's, he's hitting with it, he's guarding with it, mm-hmm. and he is on guard. He's not playful. He's not picking up things. He's not swinging from ropes. He's not picking up sticks. That was a serious fight. He was tense. Yeah, because he, he was, was on his toes. Because he his was hand a stage was fighter out. also. I mean, he knew. He, there, there was actual sword fighting happening then. The rest of it was adorable, and it was a lot of fun to watch. But there was only one that's, genuine threat. That's str- I'm just I'm sad that, that you say that you didn't like the choreography. I, because No, I did like the choreography. Yeah. I'm saying there was one bit of real sword fighting okay. I, I think the fight with christopher lee and uh d'artagnan d'artagnan with, the, yeah, with, d'artagnan the, d'artagnan with the lights and what's his name rochefort rochefort yeah, yeah rochefort. i thought that was an amazing scene yes the, it was but it wasn't it's a fantastic scene i with loved the, the fight i with, loved everything about with it the, yeah. with the lamps yeah mm-hmm. it is it is really 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 well done i i mean not necessarily sword play wise but cinematically it's a it's a yeah it speaking really of light there was a, there was a scene uh, it was uh, Constance and D'Artagnan. Uh, he had just come back to her. Uh, Roquefort was coming mm-hmm. back, and they, they hide in the thing. That one candle lit up lit an the, amazing yeah. amount of room because he blew out the one candle, and the room was bright, and then darkness. So back to the, I'm going to go back to the choreography because I have the swordplay choreography. Please Because I have something with that. All right. Uh, because William Hobbs actually was the choreographer who's done a lot of choreography fighting. Mm-hmm. Uh, the Duelists, which I'm not that big of a fan of the movie, but the ending is almost shot for uh, uh, County Monte Cristo almost takes shot for shot for the end of that. You're not a fan of the Duelists? No, I'm not. Oh my god, this is one of my favorite films of Ooh, all. Seriously, time. I'm with you, Scott. One it's of, also an extremely gameable movie. Oh, I'm sure it yeah. is. One of one of my best friends back in Phoenix, uh, uh, Chris, he brought over this movie to another friend's house. Like, oh my god, this is one of the greatest movies. You need to watch it, and it's great. And I I probably like wept through the whole movie because I was so bored until I got to the very end. I'm like, oh, this looks just like Mount Count of Monte Cristo. And he's like, oh, yeah, because the guy that did the sword play for this movie did the sword play for Count of Monte Cristo. I love the duelist. Like, okay. I don't like it. Oh, and man. Harvey I've Keitel. never seen it. <laughs> it's slow. Oh, my God. It's slower than Molasses. I love Lawrence of Arabia. It's I slower than slow. <laughs> Molasses in winter with permafrost. But it is one of Ridley Scott's first movies. Yeah, I don't care about that. It's an amazing movie. <laughs> it's wonderful. Wait, you don't care about that? Not, no, no, that movie was people? that movie was that bad. Wow. I, was, I just like scratched that one off. Oh, it's All on right, the right. list. Uh, and then we have Flash Gordon. Uh, ah! He also did the <laughs> choreography for Excalibur, the early eighties movie. <laughs> I loved Excalibur. I know. Is that uh, on the list? Now, Brian Blessed. <laughs> what if? He were in this movie. I could totally see him as Porthos. He would have. <laughs> Brian Blessed, yeah. yes. Brian Blessed is Porthos yeah. in real life. Yes. <laughs> would have been fantastic. Oh, God. They probably didn't ask him because, like, you know what? It'd just be, be you being you. So Sometimes you just got to go with what yeah. they know, though. Uh, he <laughs> also did choreography for Lady Hawk. I saw that on opening day with a bunch of SCA guys. <laughs> it was fantastic. Uh, Willow, the Mel Gibson version of Hamlet, yes. Shakespeare in Love. Uh, as I said, the County Monte Cristo, and then he's done a lot of swordplay in uh, HBO's Game of Thrones. Right, I now. like every single one of those movies you mentioned, including Hamlet. I'm a big fan of the Mel Gibson Hamlet. I really, I know it's chopped up and moved around a lot, but it's one of my favorites. It, it's funny that we that we bring up certain movies here, like we bring up Mel Gibson's Hamlet, we bring up uh, the County Monte Cristo. Uh, the Duelist, and it's funny because a lot of the people that actually worked on this movie uh-huh. worked on all of those other movies. Like the cinematography, uh, the cinematographer David Watkin, 
He also worked on the Mel Gibson version of Hamlet, so it looks pretty. That was great. Uh, yeah. Memphis Bell, Moonstruck, Out of Africa, and Chariot, oh, Out of Africa, and Chariots of Fire. I'm, oh, dun, Chariots dun, of Fire. Dun, 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 dun. It was directed by Richard Lester, who was also known for The Four Musketeers, which was just after this, obviously. Right, right. You don't say. Really. <laughs> don't say, yeah. There's a third one, too, right? What else? Uh, yes, there is, a, there is a third film called Return of the Musketeers, which is loosely based on the book 20 Years After. And it, is, it was actually filmed 20 years mm-hmm. after the, this original. And all the same actors appear as... Oh, my God. Except, really? except for, for Roy Kinnear. Roy he, Kinnear appears as Roy Kinnear. Appears as Planchet, mm-hmm. but unfortunately there was an accident during filming and he died. Yeah, and it, he died yeah, during wait, filming. He di- what? He died on a on he a died on movie? set on a um, horseback accident. Yep. Yeah. Oh, Did you see that scene where he so hit sad. the tree in this one? I mean, if he oh, was yeah, trying yeah, to reprise were, stuff yeah. like that, that <laughs> no, that was him. I'm pretty yeah. sure that was him. Oh yeah, but yeah. it's 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 comedic. He's he's really he was really well known for doing comedic stuff. I one have of, no idea. One of the cool things I found out about it was that the director uh, actually he never he didn't let the star power stop him from making actors into stuntmen on this movie. I noticed that because so, I, I looked to see where the disconnect is on faces, mm-hmm. on height, and stuff like that. And Dusty, I have to say. It looked like a lot of this was done by the people. It oh, was. No, it was. It, it really was. A lot of people got hurt. Uh, they got hurt real bad. Not real <laughs> bad, but they were like sliced open. They yeah, were yeah. cut, broken arm, ripped tendons. All the actors suffered big uh, medical issues because of this. On Dusty's recommendation, I watched, or no, it was Scott's recommendation. I watched a video interview of Christopher Lee. Uh, oh, God. from the DVD extras, but then I also watched a number of them on YouTube as well, and he talks about sword fighting and how he got stabbed multiple times in The Three Musketeers. Mm-hmm. And he, In fact, I think he got stabbed in his first fight, and he just sort of had to keep going. No, that was actually Michael York. In, in, in the final battle between Rochefort and D'Artagnan mm-hmm. yeah. in the, the Four Musketeers, the final battle, there's a scene where D'Artagnan grabs Rochefort's blade, and his hand gets cut open. And there's a close-up of his hand. The glove is sliced open, Mm -hmm. and the hand is bleeding. That is Michael York's hand bleeding because he grabbed the blade. (laughs) (laughs) Well, Um, Christopher Lee himself said in the interview, it's like, yeah, I got stabbed in the first fight and just kept going. Well, Christopher Lee was an unconscionable badass. He also talked about how heavy those swords were because they were all real. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Yeah, a a real sword is, is... it's a piece of metal that you're holding on but to the end of. Back to the whole choreography <laughs> and the whole stunts thing. Those weren't stunt swords. That they no, were they using. were real. Yeah. They were, honest to goodness, sharpened, ready to go, yeah. live live metal, basically. Yeah. Um, the director also, uh, a lot of directors do this now, but then not many did it at all. He would just turn the cameras on and let it run because he didn't want to miss anything. Something that might look good he could use later on. So he was kind of one of the fathers of that. I approve of that entire style of filmmaking. So do I. Because then you get the the honest, Mm -hmm. the the natural, instead of the the staged. Mm -hmm. And it is a very effective way of doing things. I approve of that. I did not know that, Dusty. And he was Mm -hmm. also one of the first directors to shoot with multiple cameras. Because a lot of the directors at that point in time would only use one and maybe a B camera, if they were lucky enough for the production company to give them. I noticed something like that. There was a scene where they, they had the sword fight, right? And mm-hmm. it's just face on, and the two are fighting. And uh, it was when the fireworks were going off. Mm-hmm. And then there's a cut to above. Yes. And the firework happens. The reactions are the same. And I thought, oh, they're, they're shooting using two cams. I didn't realize that was one of the first times. Keep going. That, that's, that's all no, I have. That's, no, no that's I think keep going with number of cameras. Um, I Three, think I saw that shot going. a couple five. of times. Five. Yeah. He had five, five cameras. cameras. Why can't we do that, Matthew? <laughs> because you don't have the insurance policy to let me shoot fireworks at you. <laughs> no, so, well, yeah. so, Matthew, it's it's easier now to let everything roll mm-hmm. because all you, need, all, digital. all you need is more it's storage space. It's not film, yeah. 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 <laughs> You're not just... You know, you don't have to buy film. You just mm-hmm. oh, Celluloid we'll buy another hard drive. Celluloid is goddamn expensive. Yeah, too. so is ten million dollars of costume rentals. <laughs> God, <laughs> right? Ninety nine cents a piece. <laughs> uh. <laughs> Sorry, is 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 that is that a real fact? Is, is no, I thing? was making a joke about the previous oh. yeah, ninety nine cent <laughs> rental. <laughs> All right. 
I was like, I realize that the dollar is inflated quite a bit. <laughs> well, Matt, Nathaniel got it. I guess it went over your head. I, I didn't even hear it, honestly. I didn't. I, was, there was laughter prior to it. Um, there was also one of the neat things that I really liked about the movie, and, and I know, Scott, you had made a comment about this while we were um, having a, a drinks the other day, uh, was that a lot of the... There's a lot going on in the background of the movie. If you oh, really yes, watch, yes. and the comedy doesn't just stay with the with the, exactly. with the actors. And yeah. I love that. There, there are like little the scenes. The of, yeah, there's yeah. people people saying things that are being muttered. That if you have a really good sound system or you have good headphones on, you can hear it. Yeah. But there's always something going on that the director wanted to show the world in its entirety, rather than here are the main actors. Watch oh, them God. and don't watch everything else going about on behind it. That and dentistry. It's done, Oh, oh God. I know. But oh, I was, yeah, I have, I was, I have notes on that myself. I was <laughs> cringing. It's but like, it's, oh, God, I can't. I can't. But I it's can't. done in a way that it doesn't look like... If you go to see like a, a high school production of something and someone's standing off to the side trying to be just nondescript character, trying to smoke yeah, try, or trying to be do like something. Background and yeah. yeah, these are actual things that everybody had their own script going on. I, and I like that. And, and they had and, their and, own and, world. And honestly, that style of filmmaking where it's so fully developed harkens back to our very first episode when we were looking at Fifth Element, mm -hmm. where even the bit players, I mean, these people or the director gave to them. I'm not sure which way it went. But everyone realized the maximum p potential of their part. And that's just something that I feel is lost when you have – mowing down backgrounds in, in like a modern movie. Everyone here was their own thing, their own character. And that's beautiful. It makes for a beautiful, beautiful film. Not just the background dialogue, but the actual live character, the, the conversations, the writing. It moved in a witty, quippy. They never paused mm -hmm. to to let a joke sink in. Like they were bantering back and forth in a way that I felt that the Disney movie, for example, didn't quite do. Because I'll agree with that. They kind of let those jokes sink yeah. in, whereas these guys were just quip, 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 quip. Yeah. And, and, and speaking of moving dialogue, I'm going to take this back to the fighting we were talking mm -hmm. about before. There is one thing that was done very, very right with the fighting. It was a running fight. Yes. And they showed that. In, Every time. In a lot of fencing, uh, swashbuckling swordplay like Errol Flynn and whatnot, they are straight up fencing. They're advancing back and forth on a line. Mm -hmm. And this... It was chaotic. It, they did use stuff at hand, yada yada yada. But I, I did like the movement of it. I think whoever the you you mentioned him earlier, the cinematographer. The no no the the fight coordinator. Ah yes. Did did an amazing job with that. And it's not their fault. Fencing takes a lifetime to learn. It's not something you just pick up. But yeah, I, I honestly thought uh, the the constant circling, the the rushing and turning of the fight was fantastic. It's funny that you mention that because today in a lot of movies that have a lot of up close fighting, rather than choreograph and choreograph well, they'll get up real close with a steady cam and it'll yeah. get real shaky so you can't really see anything. Some movies and some production companies and directors are starting to move away from that, but there was a big trend it started with like the Bourne movies, more or less. That you'd get, they get in real close for that up close Krav Maga fight. Yeah, yeah. And it's neat, but it gets a little overdone. And I, I want to see a big choreograph scene. I'm going to bring this back around to where we started. Oh, sure. This little tangent of the uh, stuff in the background. Mm -hmm. Nathaniel mentioned the dentistry scene. Oh, oh God! <laughs> that that <laughs> is one of my biggest like triggers. What did he say? And easy in, easy out. Yeah, that e was just easy in, easy oh, out. God. I easy in, easy out. Love. I have always wondered where the hell that tree came from. Oh, there's a I, full tree in the background, <laughs> just in a cart. Just go. I'm like, where is it co going from? Where's it no, coming Scott, from? Where's it going? Entirely right. And, and it's did not great, even see the tree. It is it? a oh, great yeah, yeah. little. Just well, that goes things. back to the machines. We, we think we, we do great works now with, with our modern things. But honestly, a lot was done with horsepower and just mm -hmm. a lot of effort. And I, I, I imagine that was going for a set piece for the king or some other rich noble who needed a tree oh. to really, you know, I mean, it was or just, just firewood. No, 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 it was, no, it was no, live. No. It was very yeah, specific. It's a yeah, giant live. live tree in the back of a cart. It's amazing. <laughs> and no, just, that, just that like two seconds too. I was yeah. too on cringing screen. at the dentistry. Day. <laughs> and, and, I had to look away. It has a own little, you, you make up your own little story about it for two seconds on screen. It's fantastic. And that is well, one of the things that I really liked about it. Th there was a lot of those moments where it's just, 
there's a story happening here. We're going to step into it, but we're not going to pursue it. And then we're moving on. Like the and dogs playing chess. Oh, God, oh, right? That was great. <laughs> there's so many moments of this. And once again, and I hate to harken back, but oh, like no, the please, fifth element, ahead. it's what makes this such an incredibly rich movie. The world is built out around the characters. Yeah, and it's, it's not it's, just and a I would, flat set. If you're yeah. just watching it for the first time to listen to this podcast, go out and buy it. This is something you will get something from every time you rewatch it. And, and and one of the things I also liked about it was that the movie itself pretty much almost follows beat for beat the book. There's a lot that they do follow. It's very true to the book, at least in my opinion. It's a lot. I agree. Not, it's okay. a little bit more slapsticky than the no, book. Yeah, and yeah. I, and oh, I, and yes. I was going to go with that. There is a lot more comedy that's added because I, I think in the when this was made in 73, there was a lot going on in the political arena. So I think that I, I think that the production company was like, let's let's put a little bit of comedy out there right now. So I think that that did help quite a bit, actually. The yeah, Richard Nixon was the president <laughs> in 1973. The political so. climate, yeah. Yeah, I, I, I can see why we needed a little levity at the time. Mm-hmm. Though it wasn't just us. This actually, this wasn't mainly done anywhere in the U.S., was it? No, it was done mostly in Spain. Yeah. Well, and, you know, the the director's English. Mm-hmm. Greater than fifty percent of the actors are English. It's just yeah. who are the Americans? I, I would say this isn't an American movie. Uh, Raquel fact. Welch was he was American. Yeah, and she Faye, is. And Faye Dunaway is American also. Charlton Heston's Charlton probably Heston. American as well. But <laughs> oh yeah, he I was, think that's a fair <laughs> assumption. <laughs> yeah. I did think that he was an odd choice for the Cardinal, but I think he, I think he did it well. I think he no. knocked but it out of the freaking at, park. I remember seeing that opening credit scene, which was fucking cool. Yeah, mm-hmm. but during that open cre- opening credit scene. Charlton Heston as Richard was like, interesting decision. Well done, though. Well done. Honestly, I, I got to touch on Charlton Heston. I, too, was hesitant now, not then. As a kid, it was just whatever was coming at me. Yeah, we didn't know. But uh, I honestly think he did an amazing job. And I will say, as much love as I have for Tim Curry, and it is a, a huge amount of love, w- at the very end where he's talking about the game and politics with Milady, mm-hmm. it... <sighs> I mean that that's that that was that was an amazing mm. bit of acting right there. Not just that though. His face did not change expression throughout the whole movie. I mean Keanu I Reeves know, can do that, but he does that well. I There's know that difference. he is <laughs> and he can express himself. Uh, you, he's Charlton Heston. Yeah. He did a good job of completely masking everything that he was saying. Because yeah. when I studied theater as a child, one of the things we talked about was in order to get into character you wanted to go through each and every line of your script and identify what is their intention, why are they saying this at this time? Yeah. Like, what is their motivating intention for saying this? And he did a good job of carrying that motivation of, I'm not going to let anybody be able to read my face at any time. No. Perfect. He was political completely mask. hidden. Good job, Charlton Heston. Seriously. Good job. Yeah. I mean. Rest in peace, my friend. Yeah. So, Dusty. Yes, Scott. I'm not too sure where you are on your movie thing there are two things i wanted to, to bring up please One, one's a rumor mm-hmm. which i'd heard long ago but i don't i've never been able to confirm it it's that each of the actors who are the musketeers had a secondary role in the film i didn't see anything about that um, i know porthos did he's uh, listed as and it. the other uh, so porthos's role is actually kept but oliver reed and um and richard chamberlain's mm-hmm. roles were cut oh um okay. so porthos if you're if you have a good eye, Porthos is also the fit Frank Finley okay. is also the jeweler in England. The English. Oh, no, that's oh, okay. The one that says uh, he it take him two weeks, and then yeah. he's told if you do it for like a thousand pounds, if you get it in the next day, and he said yes. Oh, yeah. Okay. I did not know yeah. that. Okay. Was it, was it one of them the guy who got the crap dropped on him from the window in the very in the beginning? No, the, the bed sure. The bedpan the, in that same scene with the dentistry and the tree I mean, that I yeah. didn't see. That's possible. It could be Richard Chamberlain, but I don't think so. <laughs> so, and the second thing, is we've been talking about all the amazing actors in this film, and we've neglected my favorite, one of my favorite actors in this film, which is Spike Milligan, who plays Monsieur Bonasseur. Oh, yes. Oh, he yeah. is, like, spot on. I'm laughing almost all the time. He's on screen. He is an amazing comedic actor. What else has he done? He did a lot of radio in the 40s and 50s, uh, English radio, but 
Like, look, look up. He's like a very well-known English. His comedian. muttering is what got to me. So, so just we're his, talking his, about the innkeeper. The innkeeper, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes. the innkeper. Okay. Uh, Constance's, uh, Constance's husband. husband. Yeah, 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 yeah. Quote, um, his his, uh, his quote, muttering unquote. in the various things as he's attempting to be a spy was just fantastic. And I don't know how much of that was scripted or how much of that was just him playing it because it it, it felt unscripted. And he was just he's, my, my, my he, muttering back in the he back. is um, he's amazing. Like the scene where where he's talking to the cardinal and he's like that man, that man right yeah, there, yeah, yeah. he did it. And the cardinal's <laughs> like, well, that's my friend. And he's like, no, not that man, someone else entirely. <laughs> like, he like one hundred one eighty immediately. He after the Three Musketeers, uh, he did work on do a lot of comedy stuff, a lot of comedy works. Uh, he did also work in the life of Brian. Yeah, uh, he played Spike. That was he did so good. Uh, History of the World Part One with Mel Brooks. Also good. And then one of my personal favorites, Yellow Beard. I don't know if anyone I else did, here at the table. I has did two good. Oh, I have Scott, no idea what that Scott, is. Scott, tell us about Yellow Beard. I, I love tell us Yellow about Beard. our experience with Yellow Beard. I loved Yellow Beard mm-hmm. growing oh, wait, up. This is a thing. And watching it on cable, like mm-hmm. all through like high school. This was a show then. It was it's a, a movie. movie. Yeah, it's it, a movie. it was a movie. It's a movie. Okay. Yeah. And then I was like, I, I remembered how it was like an amazing movie. And so I tried to get my, I got Nathaniel and some other friends together to watch it. And I'm watching it and I'm like, this is not very good. <laughs> I was with them. I was like, this is, Scott, what 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 have you done? <laughs> so, so, but we all agreed. We all agreed. There actually were a couple of funny scenes, yeah. but not as many as you remember. Uh, most of them. You know, Mr. Prostitute was a fantastic, mm-hmm. hilarious line. Most of it had to do with the timing of certain lines. Yeah, I'll have to yeah. go back and watch so, it because the, I remember it being a, a hilarious movie. The cast is great, but the movie, n- no. Okay, I'll have to go back and watch that then. Yeah, I it got it. Did got not age well. Okay, I'd like to bring up real bring fast, up Matthew. We'll go far um, away. At, at the very beginning, where he's where D'Artagnan is leaving his father, and his final advice is, "Don't sell the horse. Let him die honorably of old age." <laughs> I, I love that. That is that that, that 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 there's a lot of sincere moments built around that character where he's he's having his own little coming of age story mm-hmm. where, you know, you go out into the world for the first time, you find acceptance, yada, 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 done to death. It's never as sincere as it was in this. I, I love that he moves into his his first uh, his first shitty apartment in in, in Paris mm-hmm. and immediately across is not only the plot hook. But also Raquel Welsh, the Constance, love interest, yeah, being a beautiful woman. That is a real thing that I think most of us who moved out their first time, whether it be to college, whether it be our first apartment, oh, yeah. yeah, wow, yes. So Scott, you made comment uh, before we started recording that you always bring a copy of the Three Musketeers. So if someone doesn't ha- has never <laughs> read it, you just give it to them. I think this is a great opportunity for Nathaniel oh, yeah, let's, to have let's a copy it. of The Three Musketeers I mean, and read it. I don't always bring a copy, but I always oh, have yeah. one on my shelf that's it's like, oh, this is the this is a the easy one to come by and it's like nine bucks. Well I will it's a I nice will, big one. I accept this and I will definitely read it. <laughs> uh, I myself am a fan of the concept of I don't lend books. Mm-hmm. I give them. Yeah. Because never lend I, read, a book. I never get them yeah. back. But yeah. back to the father in the books. In the book, he's only in the first chapter called The Three Gifts of Monsieur D'Artagnan. Yeah, yeah. And it's also a mildly comedic writ. It's also, DeMoss wrote it mildly comedic to start off with. You know, the, the horse is a big, funny yellow horse, a fun, funny mm-hmm. color yellow horse. Yeah. I never, I never understood he, in where he first meets uh, Rochefort. Rochefort. Yeah, Rochefort. Is, is buttercup a derogatory term? Yeah, because it's it's the the horse is yellow. Is, it, is it which yellow is unu- horse indicative of cowardice? Or? It's just unusual. I oh, think it okay. was also he was making fun of it being like a, a farm country horse. person's yeah. horse. Yeah. 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 Okay. Well, come on now, Buttercup. Because even even Aramis makes comment about him being a country bumpkin. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. The, well, he, he was. was. Well, that that goes back to the whole uh, Gascon mm-hmm. Gascony. Mm-hmm. I do, I do love the manners in every part of this. Forgive me, madam, but I must go kill your friend. Yeah. <laughs> or, or uh, he sounded a bit foreign. Yeah. What yeah. is it? What is it? Uh, when when Porthos is disarmed at that end of that fight scene, I really like. Mm-hmm. And he goes, "No, leave him to me." And he goes leaping out of frame. <laughs> well, that and they also Just, like toss swords back and forth, and yeah. occasionally will hand them back to their enemies. Yeah, yeah. never do that. Yeah. Also, never. Grab your uh, blade by the hilt and use it as a club. Just, just no. Go. That's ac- that was a very common medieval fighting it was technique. Not. I've seen many treatises on it. 
We should have a chat about this, and I can show you. I'll all tell you. Kind we of, we should just. I have armor upstairs. We should just suit up and try. <laughs> okay, <laughs> that's <laughs> it. <laughs> We, I can we can dig down into this in a, in a later thing, but there's actual like uh, all right, all treatises right. on 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 melee fighting that show knights grabbing the yeah, sword. Yeah, but that's that's mailed knights. We're not talking musketeers, unarmored yeah, combat. But rapiers, the the swords that they were mostly fighting with are stabbing swords, not slashing swords. Those weren't or not chopping swords. So it's mostly I'm, I'm not going to mostly get into the definition weapon. of swords. But those, is well, this gonna? Is this I gonna... studied fencing. You studied armor fighting, right? Well, I've also studied fencing. Okay. Is this but. another Cosmo discussion? It could I, I'm be. I'm willing to do this, but <laughs> it, it tends to get cut yeah. because I just I don't back down. So. You don't. You don't. <laughs> but I don't either, so that's why you know. I do. There's there's spotting. one thing I, I I loved in this that I that just shone through, and that was the Musketeers and D'Artagnan, and even to an extent the Cardinals Guards, was. Their joy in combat, their joy in, in oh, they loved it. They absolutely in martial loved it. fighting. Um, it was their redress for every possible situation that they could encounter, and they eagerly sought it out. Everybody, yeah, was like, "Fuck it, swords!" I, <laughs> a fantastic way to settle your differences, and I think it's completely missing in modern society. I would <laughs> love to draw blades so much more often. I think my. We had talked prior before recording about talking about favorite scenes. Yeah. I think uh, my favorite scene in this entire movie. What you got, Dusty? Was the, we lost all of our money <laughs> and we need to have food. Oh, and oh the bar, yeah. The, the bar fight, fight scene. The bar fight yeah. scene where they're stabbing at chickens. <laughs> and that was really fun. And throwing them across yeah. to where Athos and D'Artagnan would Oliver Reed's them. straight face as oh. everyone flung food at him. It just catching was out of fantastic. the air. Fantastic. Tucking it away. Yes. I think that was my favorite scene out of the entire movie. Because food is serious business. No, 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 no. It's not because it was food. It's because it was everything was well timed. Uh, it was, it my, was fantastic. My favorite scene was more subtle. Uh, that was a fun one, mm -hmm. but this is one that I actually wrote a note about, and it was the transition from when D'Artagnan and Planchet, 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 mm -hmm. where they there are finally no arrived at Buckingham, and they're following the Duke into. Or ba they basically you're wrong. Oh, yeah. I oh, have yeah. a note, so, too. So you're talking that, about the... That one moment right there, the Duke holds his hands out. Someone comes out and washes it for him mm -hmm. or hands him a thing, and he starts doing it. And from that specific moment, right up until they make it all the way to the room that the Duke has set up for his beloved as mm -hmm. a shrine... A you creepy. A in, creepy shrine. Yeah. You see in action the portrayal of nobility... How all yes, of his yes. servants are scrambling around him. They're not even actually no, they're not even scrambling. They're it's just orchestrated. There. Yeah, they are there, it's waiting and ready for all of these things. And that blew my mind. And has that will forever color the way that I portray my noble characters in games that I run for the future. I also have notes on this because that that is a, that is an honest betrayal, a uh, betrayal, portrayal <laughs> of. Um, of the nobility at the time and the value of people, uh, equality is a very, very but, recent but frequently value. You see but did you like notice that. between the servants? One is a servant to a duke. One is a servant to a, to a servant. penniless yeah. musketeer. Not even a musketeer, just a bumpkin in a nice. And he was outfit, just so right? very happy oh, yeah. to be there, and they were clearly no, no, no. looking down on, he, on him. But the servant of such a man is not the equal of a servant. So of of the yeah. servant of of the duke, and when he's trying to get through the door. Yep. Yep. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, there there are there are levels, and one of the things that isn't adequately expressed in the movie, well, it, because it's not a theme of the movie, is the the various levels of the rank of the people at all levels. Be it duke, be it musketeer who's a nobleman, be it just base musketeer, be it a uh, house servant to a favored man, be it house servant to a penniless nobody. That there are ranks at every level of this. You see that in the chess game. You see that all over this, and it is that is spot on accurate. I do like that he. Well, I got two things, but I do like first that what you're just saying. Like he literally walked into a bar and bought that man. Oh yeah, <laughs> yeah. He he's checked sizing the it up. teeth. He yep. checked two the men teeth before and him. picked them out from a list from mm -hmm. a from a rank. He's like, nope, you're with me. But what I wanted to touch on with the Duke was that portrayal of nobility. Frequently, when you see something like that in a movie or a show, and somebody is that fawned upon by servants, 
they also tend to have some kind of an ineffectual quality to they themselves. Or, or they tend man. to be foppish. They tend to be overly rude or genteel or weird or somewhat or detestable. Or it's a function of the villain. Or of the of the antagonist in the movie, yeah. but in this, that wasn't carried this, off. That was, was just part of the station. Yeah, and he was a capable. You could see that this guy could put his own clothes on. He just walked down the hall, and people did it for him anyway. I have people but he, for that. They weren't <laughs> fawning over him. They weren't. Oh my god, let me touch. Though he was just thump, thump, boom, 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 and he moved on yeah. down like it was no thing. I found it interesting the way that they portrayed him as being both born to. Oh, very much. Not not but, an eye batted. But yeah. also quite capable. Yeah. That's actually a very good point, Nathaniel. I also think that uh, very capable as he is, he didn't know how to wash his hands. Oh, like well. when he had that deer's blood on him and he dips them in. I think he may have gotten half of the first <laughs> finger oh. segment. You know, you that too, as he huh? reaches for the message, his yeah. hands are still dripping blood. Okay, if I had to pick <laughs> one favorite scene. Oh, okay. That's why so, I said just one. Okay, just one. I, and I wrote this as Constance's boobs. I have B E W B S. <laughs> when uh, what do they call it? A planikin? When you're carried through the streets? That's called a planquin. Oh, palanquin. I know what scene you're talking uh, about. Palanquin. Yeah, I know what scene and, you're talking about. And she's oh, hiding a planquin uh, from the sale. I've heard it both ways. <laughs> but that that was probably my favorite scene. The nobleman who's going boobs have magically <laughs> appeared. <laughs> If, if the I, look on his face of puzzlement. I, I, I realize that it is not a scene of great depth or dra- <laughs> dramatic value. Honestly. But it was very well played. They're fantastic boobs. And I'm a simple man. And that was my favorite part. The, the thing that I thought about with that scene, if I had been writing the script, I would have written a bit line for him saying, the Lord giveth and then the Lord taketh away. Because they were there and then they were gone. <laughs> so, boobs. Manny, my favorite scene, yes, Scott, is when Rochefort comes to arrest the innkeeper, Monsieur Bonacieux. Spike Milligan wakes up and he like reaches under the bed and pulls out his his pistol. Oh, his flintlock! Yeah, a, his, his little. It's actually a wheel lock. He pulls out his wheel Sorry. lock and it doesn't work. Oh, and then he has to reload it and he's like trying to reload it and then the it doesn't work and then he has to dump everything out onto the bed and like push this thing like. And and Rochefort is just like <laughs> looking at him, and then he walks over, just takes it, and takes he's feeling no threat. No, at not at all. Not like, at all. Yeah. <laughs> Christopher Lee he just like walks over, takes the gun, throws it on the bed, and resigned Spike Milligan's character walks away, and then pauses for a moment at the door, and longingly looks looks back at the bed as if, but I could, uh, no. And then sorry, Manliness walks out roll the scene. Zero. <laughs> yeah, it to me, I. I I laugh out loud at that scene every single time. I don't know. It he had some me. of the the best comedy bits in the entire bit. I, I am a colossal pervert. I went for the boobs, <laughs> but that is a valid scene. <laughs> okay. <laughs> the the one thing I did want to mention, which, which is in the books mm-hmm. and in the movie, but should not be in the game, <laughs> is in the books and in the movie. All the women are horrible people. Yeah. All the women cheat on their husbands. Or, so so the, the innkeeper's wife sees D'Artagnan and immediately goes to sleep with him. That's a function of the period, though. In, in, in French culture at the time, that was not... It was considered proper to keep a mistress. Or, uh, it really was. Yes, but... but Several but mistresses, if you can afford it. I, I agree in the time, but we're talking about the 70s, not the 1600s. This is a movie for the 70s. Yeah. It's very misogynistic, and, none, and the, the primary villain... Which you might think is Richelieu or Rochefort isn't. It's Milady de Winter. She's a horrible, horrible person. And in the books, she's even more horrible. They go way into how horrible she is. I remember her in the movie and being terrible. What, Rebecca de Mornay, wasn't it? Well, that was in, yeah, the, in the, the 90s version. So, yeah. the, the so Disney one. None of the women are portrayed very well at all. Um, on top of it, not being very modern, but even in the 70s or 1830s when this was written, they're French. Nobody is anything but. White, and those are fine in the books or the movie from the seventies. But modern times allow for the differences in your game. I wholeheartedly agree, and it's a major point that I'm going to bring up in a bit. The Musketeers television show, which Nathaniel has mentioned a couple of times, which is brand new BBC, well, new Ish. just cap- <laughs> last couple of years, uh, up to three seasons, I believe. 
I about, think it's, it is three seasons entirely. It was. Is it like eight to complete. ten episodes a season? Thirty episodes total. So ten episodes a yep. season. Um, the Porthos character is actually played by a um, Spaniard. I think or uh, uh, he's Hispanic. No, he's half. He's half black, half white. Okay, a, yeah, a, a person of color. He's a person a, of a color. Non-white dude. He's a person of color, and yeah. um, and it's a partial homage to Alexander Dumas, who was a quarter black. His father's mother was Haitian. No, oh, I did not know <clears> that. Well, you think? I mean, because when you see other historical <clears throat> depictions from the time, it is it is all white. But then you think France, and France is a continental country. I mean, it, it's part of the continent. There would be people from all around the world in a Absolutely. French court, yeah. Mm-hmm. As opposed to, it's a bit of a harder travel to get to England. It's a an isolated island. Um, there would be less of that in an English historical thing at the time. That's a that's a very interesting point. Yeah, and you might have darker Spaniards seeing as the Moors. Oh, certainly, the, the Moors had been yeah. there, and yeah, there's so that is a very yeah. Interesting the seventies. So I, actually I don't think the seventies did a good, did no. an accurate portrayal of the time. But again, it was also they had a target audience in yeah. mind. They did yeah. great with the book, yeah. and it's a hilarious film, and it's an amazing film. It's of its time. Yeah, that's fair. Okay, well let's uh, let's get into the game, shall we? Let's do it. All right. Hi everyone, this is your favorite host, Matthew. This week's episode is brought to you by Guardian Games, who we are proud to have as our sponsor. Guardian Games is Portland's largest gaming store. They have almost every game you can think of, be it role-playing, board game, card games, miniature games, even video games. They also have a ton of gaming-related material and some pretty neat swag. I mean, the D20 fuzzy dice that go in your mirror, that's good stuff. If uh, (laughs) if you're 21, uh, you can have a drink in the back at the Critical Sip. Booze makes gaming better. Always has, always will. There's free games back there. You'll love it. Uh, they also have a friendly and incredibly knowledgeable staff, and they are the hub of a diverse and friendly gaming community. Um, if you're in Portland, you definitely want to go to Guardian Games. kids thanks for listening to us through the break right now we're going to go into how to game the three musketeers and uh i think nathaniel and scott scott has i think a record over there and nathaniel is feverishly pulling things up on this little laptop here what do we have for this i'd like to open by saying that this movie when i was watching it i felt that so much of this movie was just one Savage Worlds agility and smarts trick after another. So Savage Worlds is one of the games that I know the most, and it has this mechanic called the agility trick, or it's got a mechanic called the trick. And you can either use agility or smarts to kind of gain an advantage on an opponent, where they kick dirt in each other's faces, where they pull clotheslines down, there was where they a try lot of psych that. them out. Non-stop tricks. I could use Savage Worlds for this, but there are some, so many other options out there. Swashbuckling and, hell, The Three Musketeers. How long is The Three Musketeers? When was it published? The book? 1800s? Right? Yeah, 1830, 1844. And how, there have been countless editions of it. There have been movies. Yeah. There have been games. This TV is, shows, cartoons. Absolutely. This is one oh, of the cartoons the are great. most heavily mined source materials for both fiction and for gaming. So there's a plethora to choose from. However, my buddy Scott is joining us here, and he's brought a stack of things, and he has something to say. I was recently doing some research. I had a question I wanted to answer, which was, in literature, what was the first adventuring party? Was it not Gilgamesh and Enkintu? Yeah, I was going to say, you can take that all the way back to Ur. Are they two people? Well, it's just two people. Does no, that count I'm, as a no. party? That's nope. more like, I think he's going with buddy. Like four I got people, you, right? I'm, okay. I'm going... It has to be at least three, uh, but I'd like four or more. So, so the, the, the two best examples that I found early literature, Jason the Argonauts yeah, and the Cal- Cal- Caledonian boar hunt, which is also a Greek myth. Uh, but both of those have like 20 guys well, and a, a girl or two, but they have a lot of, lot of people. So it's like, it's not like something you could play as it, you know, and it's not like you could easily discern who's who. You know, like, oh, is this guy? Well, this guy's a fighter. Well, this guy's a fighter. Well, this guy's a fighter. Like, right. Like, so you have, like, like tons of guys. So I was like, I need something a little more pared down. So the next best example I could come up with 
is Robin Hood. Yeah, I was going to say the uh, the, the original That's Robin Hood. Was go. Robin Hood is from from uh, the first published works in the 12th and 13th centuries. What about Journey to the West? Is ah, that... see, I wasn't even thinking. I was thinking Western literature. Okay. But, you know, I'm not saying that this, that's not. I don't actually know when that was published, but I know um, that it's old. But so Robin Hood is very good. You, you, you know, you have Robin Hood, Little John, Friar Tuck, Will Scarlet, Alan and Dale. Alan and Dale. And so Mary, Maid Marian. Those are all very, very. The first Smurfette. Very oh. distinctive characters. You can be like, you know, uh, Will Scarlet's the, you know, sneaky rogue guy and. Little John's the big burly. He's the tank. He's the tank. So they have definite characteristics. But The Three Musketeers is the first modern literature. And modern literature actually starts to come about in the early, late late 1700s, early 1800s. What technically is called modern literature. And The Three Musketeers is the first adventuring party. The first one where all four, four or more, are equal partners Mm -hmm. in the group. Mm -hmm. So I I like... Thinking Ivanhoe, but I think that's after that. Yeah, that's Walter Scott, and that's yeah. also basically that's, that's, that's a Robin weird. Hood. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's it's Ivanhoe plus Robin Hood. Yeah, and I think that's also written later, wasn't it? I I'm not familiar with when uh, Ivanhoe was written, but sorry, back to adventuring. I'm just curious where you were going with that. Any like oh oh I want I w- it was the fact that I wanted to, like since we were starting about talking about adventuring and and the game, I want I wanted to kind of. Bring That's liter- a very interesting like, question. Like, 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 segue into it with, you know... If any of our listeners into the game. has what they consider to be the earliest example of, of the adventuring party in modern literature, in, in modern literature leave, leave a comment below, because that's actually something that I'm really interested in. I, I'd like to hear what you think. And Matthew, your statement about our listeners reminds me, uh, and we opened our episode with this for the first time, and we should probably keep doing this in the gaming section. We are not going to be diving into dozens of games. Uh, One thing that we're going to do is try and pick one game that we are ultimately planning on playing in a video. Yeah. Every game that I mentioned Palladium Fantasy (laughs) 4 will be some kind of an honorable mention. Right. We can dive into other games and how you might play them. And we could even deep dive into how you can take some of these games and turn them into a long-term campaign, something you might want to bring to your table for extended play. But ultimately, we're going to choose one game, and this one game might not end up being the best game for you, but the one game that we choose, the the winner of each episode, is the game that we are putting into a hat to be voted on, on which episode you're going to and see And voting's happening right now on our first series. This uh, is true. This and is And interesting things are happening. I did not expect it to go that way. I'm not going to go long into it. But I'm. I, it's fascinating to watch how this is going down. It's going in a way that I did not expect. Me either. Uh, yep. So I do want to go ahead and do a quick number of honorable mentions. What you got? As I do, I pulled my Google Plus friends and I pulled Reddit looking for examples of things to play. There were a number of threads of people who have already discussed the Three Musketeers and how to play them at a table. So kind of just jumped into there and found some ideas and researched them on my own. The first one I'm going to mention it's one called Honor Plus Intrigue. It looked pretty cool. I didn't really have the money to buy it at the time, so I can't really dive into it. But it's one that I wanted to mention as it looks thematically appropriate. Title alone check it out. sounds yeah. about right. I Intrigue and honor, right? Yeah, I was going to say the same thing, actually. There's another one that kind of takes the whole Musketeers concept and takes it to its own new alternate setting. It's called Swashbucklers of the Seven Skies. It was a little Is this offbeat. airship pirates? It's basically. Ah! Flying <laughs> musketeers and swashbuckling stuff. I skimmed over it. It looked really cool, mm-hmm. but ultimately it diverged so greatly from the, the thematic core of the musketeers and the setting that it's like, eh, I'm going to give it a mention, but we're not going to talk about it. Right. Dusty? So just the title alone, is it a steampunk game or no? It looked a little bit. Okay. Again, right. I, I did curious. not... I did not delve so deeply okay, into all right. it. It had a lot of the themes. I can't tell you much more about it. But it looks like something that if somebody wants some kind of a, I'm guessing, steampunk action, mm-hmm. that's one you might want to look into. Okay. All right. 
And another one is called Seventh C. Yeah. Oh, I love Seventh C. So this game was kickstarted like a year or two ago. Yeah. A buddy for a second edition. edition. Yep, a buddy of mine worked and on it. And they actually just won some innies oh, this really? past week in uh, the Ian World yeah, yeah. Yep. Gaming Awards. Uh, my buddy Ben Werner and then John Wick, who who restarted it. Um, wait, wait, wait. John Wick worked on <laughs> it? It's confusing. Yeah, I know. Right? I know. I yeah. know. No, no, no. My, my, my buddy's been working with John Wick for a number of years. Uh, and I was very, very proud of of Ben and, and everybody. Congratulations, that, guys! That got on that. So my only familiarity with Seventh C comes from the first edition, mm-hmm. which played in many ways similar to the Legend of the Five Rings with the roll and keep system. Same guy developed I it. Really love the roll and keep system. Oh, that's interesting, and I think we should give a solid shout out to them for winning. Yeah, definitely, and it's good what they've done with it. I've heard mixed reviews on the mm-hmm. second edition. They say it's kind of stripped down a lot of the elements that people loved about the first edition so i don't have much knowledge of it i wasn't in on that kickstarter it only came out recently and again i didn't have the money to acquire it right also it diverges heavily from the core musketeer theme it's more sailors and swashbuckling Mm -hmm. right right it is the king's guard and dashing chivalry kind of things that the musketeers focus on when you get off this game i actually have a question but go ahead scott i remember the first edition and if i remember correctly and i may be incorrect each region was more patterned after a a, you know a region from history so like they were scandinavian or french or or german or whatever and if you just you know stuck within your region you could probably have more landlocked adventures than you know you're just using the rules you don't necessarily have to use the setting Definitely. You, you could certainly do that. Um, I didn't want to dive in too deep because I found other games that I think would work better. Did uh, And this is just a quick question, not an, honor, not an honorable mention or anything, but did D&D, what is it, one or two? Uh, Swashbuckler. Did that, did I think that, that ever was come two. in? I think that was a second. Did, did that make the list my of honorable? First, my first memory of the Swashbuckler was in second edition in the handbooks yeah so there, i know there was there was one in the fighter there was a handbook. kit yeah the kits yeah kits were cool yeah i now so realize that my mm-hmm. former love of second edition was mostly nostalgic but at the time i thought it was pretty cool and second edition also had a more renaissance swashbuckling setting called red steel yes i remember that that, that was, was one that i never read I've only heard about it from people who... I played a whole campaign in it. It was fun. Was, was it set... There was another game in that setting. Uh, You're thinking uh, the, 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 the Dark Sun? No, not Dark Sun. No, I'm very Dark familiar Sun. with Dark, Dark Sun. Dark Sun was not my no. favorite. But there's a, no. I'm pretty sure that there was a second campaign setting that shared the same Red Steel. Maybe Red Steel was in Farron somewhere? I think it might or have Mistara? been more like Ravenloft. I don't yeah. remember. Oh God, is going to ne- somebody is going to correct us on this? Probably. Yeah, Please so, like, don't worry, let us know. <laughs> I, I'm all for people. If only we had us. computers right in front of us. We could I, I'm, I'm like, sorry, um, Nathaniel. I didn't there mean there to was take also a swashbuckler cl- kit for the thief in the thief's handbook. It was a slightly different from the fighter. I, they still had it in yeah. 3.5. I dropped out there of D. But if you so. also want to keep it on a more traditional level, Palladium. First edition fantasy. It's not and me, then, Dusty. Dusty, it's not me. <laughs> and then later, the second edition had a book three of the Palladium fantasy series, is Adventures on the High Seas. And I remember rules that one for swashbuckling <clears throat> and paired did Palladium weapons, have that? Nathaniel, weapons. that's that's very interesting. I I did not know that. <laughs> we talk about Palladium a lot. It's because many of us cut our teeth on it. We have <laughs> fond memories of it. I don't I enough excuses. I have no it's fond okay. memories of that game system. Seven. Well, I have at least one it can, not fond memory of you it, and recording in our bonus episode. I know. It can burn for all I care. <laughs> <laughs> but, so before we delve into anything else, Scott, you brought something very exciting looking. That it, I it, never it even... looks like an LP. Yeah, it's it does. Gorgeous. I actually, when, when, when Scott pulled it out, I thought it was like the record story play yeah. of the Three Musketeers. Actually, I wasn't. I have the soundtrack on vinyl. Mm-hmm. I just wasn't able to, to find it. I know where it is. It's just kind of packed away. I've seen it at your house. Yeah, uh, your old house. So um, this is a board game from Yakinto Publishing. In I don't know when it ha- when it was came out in the eighties. Uh, it is called a album record album game. 
So it's a record album game because it comes in what's a, effectively a record album. Uh, it's as thin as a record and the same square. So, but it, it says it doesn't contain dice, which it doesn't. But I mean, but you, it uses them. It uses them. You have to okay. provide your own dice, which is just two d six. But um, it's not one of those that came with like the cutout that you could fold and assemble your own dice. No. Oh um, God. That's I've, awful. I've seen many old games that way. But really? it's just it's it's rules and chits. And then you open it up, and it has two maps on it. One is a tavern, and one is one is two ships facing the, each other. Those ships look pretty versatile too. If you you could probably adapt this to like an airship game, or even free, even like a a Jules Verne submarine. So this is it's strictly a board game. I mean, it's strictly it has it has really it's the combat is really interesting. I really like how it's done. Because it's really meant to, they really tried to bring in that swashbuckling feel. Uh huh. So amongst the actions you can do: throw dagger, throw sword, throw mug, shove chair. Wait, wait. Throw mug. Throw mug is a specific. Throw action. chicken. <laughs> throw mug is a specific action. Yank carpet is a specific action. Oh. Somebody rolled a zero. Carpet. Wave hat is a specific action. Wow. So so those are just general actions, and then you have the, the sword play stuff, which is just lunge, parry, slash, etc. And I then see you that have beautiful action grid there. Then on you the back. have movement stuff. Now is this is this a board game or is this an RPG? This is this is just strictly board game. Yeah, okay. it's, it's but, so you're not playing a character, you're just rolling dice and moving counters or Yes, but you also but you actually have a character that has stats, and your stats are uh, strength, endurance, constitution, which is actually strength plus endurance, <laughs> and expertise, which is just a modifier to how how well you do things. Uh-huh. Uh huh. And you take your constitution and you divide it amongst your right arm, left arm, head, and body, however you want. So maybe your head is stronger than your body or whatever. And then once you lose <laughs> your constitution, is basically your hit points. Once you lose the hit points on that area, then you're if you're it's your head, then you're knocked down or you're unconscious. Your right arm or your left arm can't function if they're more damaged and it's quick and and the, how they do the turns is every every action or something has a specific amount of time and uh-huh. so you just when you want to do that action you just you you plug it in and it's like a program so like oh this takes two turns to to do so in two turn two turns this will happen but you have your little sheet how you've programmed what you're going to do and and nathaniel's program what he's going to do and dusty's program what he do and then you all go like, oh, well, I'm lunging. Well, I'm moving backwards and I'm doing this. So it it's the cacophony of the fight. <laughs> it really sounds like comes you played out. this. Yes, I played this. Nice. <laughs> yeah. I um, could easily see like tacking on some kind of a very basic social structure to this and just honestly, yeah. Role playing in a kind of a freeform system. We just sort of hang out, talk about our characters. The way that you I was right taught to role play top. didn't yeah. even involve character sheets. I remember when I was eight years old, my older brother who was staying over, and we were in our bunk bed. I was on the bottom, and he was on the top. And at one point in the middle of the night, he rolls over, leans down, and says, hey, man, you want to play a game? I'm like, yeah. Okay, cool. Uh, you're a uh, knight, and you're going into a cave to do some things. What do you do? And my mind exploded with opportunity. <laughs> my, my brother, that was the most fun I'd ever had as a kid. I honestly... Re- oh, go ahead, Dusty. My, I'm my, sorry. my brother pretty much did the same thing with me. He's like, you want to play a game? I was like... Yeah, he's like, okay, so you have a sword, and here's this character, and a dragon's in front of you. What, what do you do? do? You do? Uh, I honestly had a moment like that do? in middle school where uh, I, a friend at the cafeteria during lunch asked me, hey, you want to play a new game? I said, sure. And he goes, you're falling. It could be through air. It could be through jello. You haven't opened your eyes yet. Nice. I said, I, I said what? Oh, my God, that's <laughs> brilliant. Yeah. Yeah. Um, hey, I, just as long as we're on this... What's your first role playing experience? Scott? My first role playing experience is uh, actually first edition D anD. d it was same it here. was it was in uh, junior high, and they're like, "Hey, the I was in band, and like the other people in the trombone section were like, "Hey, we're playing, we're going to be playing D D. We have a D anD D club, and so I went down there and made a dwarf and played. <laughs> yeah, played solid Island. choice. Yes. Played, are we all dwarf? Play- yeah, played dwarf, Isle of Dread dwarf. is like that's the very first thing. I, I typically play a, a dwarven battle cleric. I but. can play anything, honestly. So I, I really can, can. Yeah, I mean, my play style has changed even since I moved to Portland. <laughs> since I met <laughs> Nathaniel, my play style has changed. I think I had uh, at least a small part in that. Yes, you did. <laughs> oh, well, 
uh, let's let's finish up with Swashbuckler no. okay. here. But what Dusty, I, could you get a, a yeah, picture of the, of the cover? Because yeah. that is a gorgeous cover. I would love to take that kind of very open ended. Okay, this is happening. What do you do? And then yeah. play something like that in a just like we used to back in the day. Play something very open ended, just totally well, up that's, to the fiat of the storyteller. That's but what finally, I like when about it comes what to you combat, bring to the table because they're they're new games. They're not these these formulaic, um, like very involved, very systemic games. They're just they're, they're so storyteller driven. And I really like about all these games you're introducing me to is they well, feel you. like they harken back to that very early first experience of gaming. That's what I prefer in most of the games that yeah. I run, at least. But if you think about it, video games, like Japanese role-playing games, Final Fantasy. Final Fantasy consists of two things. Walking around and talking to people mm -hmm. and getting into combat. Well, what if we take that in a tabletop game? We just walk around and talk to people and go with what happens. And now we're in combat. We break out this game. Yeah. And play it out. That's That would be a great hack for that. Yeah. That is 100% what I was thinking and yep. why I brought this specific game. I think that's fantastic. But I happen to know Nathaniel and I are on the same page for the final recommendation. Do you have any more honorable mentions? I do have one. I'm going to dive into two games. but Matthew? Can I say one real quick? Yeah. Uh, just D&D, Swashbuckler. It's all a campaign setting. The, the Swashbucklers there. Well, the, here's the thing with There's D &D. also a Musketeer. Well, here's, the, here's the problem. D&D &D is, unless you are committed to like a one shot or maybe one, or one, one to three sessions... This is the game where everybody is playing the exact same character class. That, I don't know. If, have any of you done this before in a yeah. game? I've, yeah, I've, I've played novelty. with musketeers in a musketeer world. Yeah, Like no mages were allowed, no non-human races were yeah. allowed. But the system itself, as long as you're not using one of their uh, worlds, works fine. Well, contrary to what may have been stated earlier, <laughs> I really like D&D. &D, especially the old school versions of D&D. &D. Where... Where's your drop off? Well, Mine was four. I like yeah, same here. Four. My so my favorite edition of D and D was published in what's called the Rules Cyclopedia, which is a collection of the series the B E C M, and it was published as B E C M I. So basic expert master yeah, yeah. challenge and immortal or challenge master and the, immortal. The the blue, the red, the black. Yeah. Are There's, you talking about those? <laughs> We're not even going to dig down. And there's so many different flavors and variants and writers of mm -hmm. what was called Dungeons and Dragons yeah, yeah. back in the day that wasn't even advanced. So that's something for another discussion. The Rule Cyclopedia collected the BECM part and added in a world gazetteer and created what I think is an amazing game. Like it collected everything in a wonderful way to play 36 experience levels of character create. And that you would never get to even seven because your character would die a horrible death because it was. I've a yet to reach eleven. Ball. That was my favorite, but I do like fifth. Fifth is fun. I I've heard good things about fifth, but I have to say fourth. Ugh, I've, I, I've, I love three point five. It was cumbersome, but it covered damn near everything. So for me, everything that was that's that's fifth ed. It's everything that you liked about second ed and everything that you liked about third and three point five meshed. Scott, for D and D. Yeah, I I like fifth. I'm playing fifth now. And, All right, I'll, and I'm, like I'm gonna pick but, up a copy. Wizards, you got me again. But enough people <laughs> that I that I I like have said good things about it's it. It's brought so. a lot of people back. Yeah, yeah. it has. I, Dude, you know, fourth I, was a freaking blunder. Fourth was basically just running an MMO on paper. No, that's what I thought it was. The the Wretched. one thing I liked about fourth was the simplicity. It was it became almost too simple. Like I had. It was the first time I never had a care. I never. I didn't have a character sheet. I had a character card. I had everything on. Yeah, oh, yeah, every, everything like on a that. card, and everything was in my little s card slots and but my I card sleeve. But I have a bulk pack like of cards. erasers. I don't understand. My final statement on why I would not do D and D for this: too many actions. No, one of the beautiful things about D and D is the diversity of character. Oh, agreed. One of the things that people love about D and D. And that makes D and D so wonderful for what it is. Ever since the beginning, is the diversity of the party. It is a team based. Each person has a role in the group kind of yeah. thing. <clears throat> so yes, if you are an enterprising group who really likes D and D and doesn't want to stray from the D twenty, you can do something like this. If you just want a whole party full of swashbucklers, I wouldn't, because. But to me, if I'm playing D&D, &D, I want a diverse cast. Like yeah. I want 
a group of people who all have different skills and abilities more than just swashbuckling. Right. So I did have two games that I wanted to showcase here at the end. So I'm going to start with the one that ultimately I think is not going to be the winner. And that one is a game called All for One Regime Diabolique. This game is done by Triple Ace. They do a number of Savage Worlds things. They have, uh, I, I think it might be their house system. It's called Ubiquity. Scott, you've read this one? I have looked into it. I haven't read the system, but I read a review and how Ubiquity works and a review of the, uh, so the character This game, thing. if you read it, reads like a Savage Worlds book. Uh, if, uh-huh. you, if you have any familiarity with any of the Savage World settings or the layout know. of their books, <laughs> this game, when I was looking into it, I almost forgot it wasn't Savage Worlds. It, it almost reads like they had a house book layout, a template in their InDesign. Uh, their, whoever was doing their layout clearly was familiar with laying out Savage Worlds books and laid this one out to the point that it looks exactly like a Savage Worlds book. However, it plays, at least it reads like it plays, like a White Wolf game. It has a dice pool system. Uh, You build a thing with stats and skills. Uh, You you have merits and flaws. The whole character creation system reads like White Wolf. If you're familiar with the World of Darkness, you can probably figure out how character creation is done in this game. Oddly enough, there is a Savage Worlds version of All for One. Really? Yeah, they, they published a Savage Worlds edition. I'm not surprised. I bet they just stripped out the text, repasted things into the template, and let it flow and pasted things in. There's actually not that much art in it either. I, I would flipping through the first section, I was like, flip, 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 flip. Okay, I've gone 40 pages and there's no picture here. This is an interesting design decision. The ubiquity system is something I'm not familiar with, but I was kind of skimming over it. The book doesn't really do the best job of presenting the system. It's several pages, and not, not just several. Dozens of pages in before it even starts talking about the actual game itself. It gives you a little quick introduction to what the game is not, which it says at the beginning. Okay. And then it tells you cool. how to make a character. And there's dozens of pages on making a character, but the reader still doesn't actually know how the system works. And <laughs> Are you sure this me, isn't Palladium? <laughs> well, <laughs> that well sounds Palladium, Palladium. <laughs> Palladium is its own special demon here. So Ubiquity System, after digging through it, kind of figured it out. And it does one thing I think that is really cool. So it builds a dice pool. Uh huh. I like dice pools. And you can use any dice. Six sided dice, eight sided dice, four sided dice, ten sided dice, whatever. All that matters is even or odd. That's how you determine success. And the system is you roll the dice, anything that's even is success, anything that's odd is a failure. But if you want, when you roll the dice, the GM can call it. The GM can say, okay, only count failures. Or only count odds. Oh, okay. Or every yeah. other this. or So you can actually get some kind of weird poker style. So you could roll a D100 or flip a coin. You, exactly. Nice. They even have their own custom dice. I didn't get a chance to look at them because the book mentioned them and they didn't tell you where to find them or what they looked like. It was really strange. Marketing team, get your shit together. I Yeah. I, I, I imagine that the Savage Worlds version of this was probably an easier game for me, more familiar with Savage Worlds. Yeah. But I have some gripes with this system, which is why I'm not choosing it. Oh, I have. I want to mention this system for for one fact about the system. What or about uh, is each character has a follower. I thought that was really cool. So you have yeah, a, that's interesting. So you have a servant, and what isn't shown in the Three Musketeer film, but is extensive throughout the book, is all four of the Musketeer characters yeah, yeah. have servants. Hmm. It's essentially. Yeah. It's true. Eight main characters. Yeah. And they are all this very distinct. And so they basically, you, you have a servant. Boom. In the movie, they kind of just In the restricted movie, it to, to, to the one, Yeah, Planche. But the, uh, the other three uh, all have servants that are relatively representative of them. So I don't want this to come across like a big old list of complaints, but these are actually some big no's for me. So this is why I'm not ultimately going with this. Again, your mileage may vary. First, I don't think the game explains itself well. Even though it may seem familiar, if you're used to something like White Wolf and that kind of character flow, it doesn't really explain things. There are charts upon charts that don't need to be there. The text will explain something. Here's how to do something. Now, here's a chart that explains exactly how we just said in the text, but in a more confusing fashion. And there's five more columns that you don't need. It was really, 
it was really confusing. I felt like they were filling space. Right. It includes practically no extended detail on the actual setting. There's no world overview. There's almost no political breakdown. No list of real important personages in the world. Uh, well, you know, you want to play some musketeers, you want to get some detail into some the musketeers. Story. You need actually. a cardinal. Yeah. 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 You, you want to have five books to reference. You want one book right here, and you want to play the game with that book. Yeah. It's got some stats for some characters in the background, but not not too many, and it doesn't really go into the climate, which is sad and unfortunate because it opens up saying this is not actually the history that you may remember. We've altered the setting a bit and mm-hmm. added some supernatural elements. Okay, that's cool. I like supernatural elements. Tell me more about them. You see, Where are I, I, they? I, I don't see that, though. If, if I was playing this game, it would be intrigue. I, 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 there would be there, there wouldn't be supernatural none. If if I personally, yeah, I don't think they were necessary. No, I I, I think that's an extraneous thing yep. that would just open it up too far. So the game doesn't even explain its basic concepts until page eighty seven. Eh. This is a, a game published in two thousand ten. That's a lot of digging. And yeah, it sound like a lot of payoff. There's no excuse anymore for at least not including like a three you know three to five page. Here's how to roll the dice. Here's the things that yeah. matter. Okay, now go read the rest of it on your own. Oh, it's it was the supernatural elements and the magic that that really made it to where you know, I was like, I don't want to have to if I'm going to choose a game system, I don't want to have to strip stuff out of it for it to be the game system I'm going to use. Yeah, I agree. If I'm gonna if I want to stick to a source material, I want to be as close to that source material as possible. So the whole not bringing things to the reader until that deep into the book. Not explaining what the system is even about. That's hard. That's hard for me, yeah. but it's nowhere near as big a sin as this last one. And this is something we've already talked about. You see, the game is nominally set in the exact same period of Earth history as the movie and the books. But the author made a rather unfortunate decision to alter the setting in questionable ways. So the book opens with bold and clear statements that it is only loosely based on period France and adds in magical and supernatural elements. Again, we're not really necessarily down with that, but whatever, I can kind of get behind it if I wanted to kind of add a little Brotherhood of the Wolf flavor to it. But then, just a couple pages after it introduces all of these things and says this is what this game is not about and we're changing history, it comes right out and says what I consider to be a cardinal sin of historical fantasy. Characters in All for One begin as members of the same organization, In this instance, every hero must be a member of the king's musketeers. Correct. Every single party member is a musketeer. Okay. Again, that's cool. But in the next paragraph, it says, the only limit being a musketeer puts on characters is that all must be male. Okay. So, hold on. If you're going to alter history by adding supernatural elements and changing things and go ahead and play sexist. But then you're going to play some sexist lines like that? No, I'm not down. No, nah, go ahead and let's toss that one back. And it, let's yeah. The then says winner. the GM can override this if they wish, but it, it shouldn't. Even, it shouldn't even be in there. It shouldn't that, even be that, in there. That is a yeah. really weird thing to put in your gaming system. That actually just that really turned me off. Yeah, yeah. that right there was when I stopped. It's like nope. And that was ninety pages in. Well, that was like <laughs> ten, that was like ten pages in. But I, I wanted to give it a good read. Oh, over good. No chicks right yeah. up front, but. <laughs> Yeah, it's it's just not kosher. That's for me. freaking it, weird. Nope, I'm not down. You are not allowed to play in our boys' club ever. So let's talk about the winner. So guys, this movie. Do you remember the first thing you saw in this movie? Yes. What was slow mo sword fight? What was well, not really slow mo. Thing on the screen besides words. What was it? The sky. The swords. It was a sword. It was a flashing blade. That's the game that I would choose called. Flashing Blades <laughs> okay. it is an early 80s RPG specifically about the Three Musketeers. Okay. Now, Scott, you have familiarity with this. Yeah, I actually owned the hard copy of this for when I was a, in high school, I believe, or I have no idea what happened to it. I really wish I could find it again. It came in a box, like, like the old yep, D&D box It had box a box set. set. Yep. It came with a, a 40-something page instruction booklet. And then it had, and that instruction booklet was deep. It delved into like social politics, how to be a banker, things like uh, you know. The climbing. art's really good. Yeah, yeah I'm looking at the, the artwork. Ladders. It looks really good. 
Yeah, so this was published, I believe, in 84, I think 84, by a fellow named Mark Pettigrew. It was, it's Fantasy Unlimited, I believe, was the publisher. Yes. Yeah, 1984. Mark Pettigrew, the author of this game, here's some trivia. He was 16 years old when he wrote and published this game. Yeah, Fantasy Unlimited, who had done some more crunchy games at the time. And this was, this is surprisingly not that crunchy. Character creation aspect of it. It's a little weird if you're familiar with modern games in that you, you roll your stats, that's fine, but then you have to do a little bit of a little bit of math magic to build what's called your expertise rating. But then once you get that, once you got that, then you have the basis for all of the other things that you do in the combat. So Flashing Blades is something of an old school game. You can look at it, it's got that basic black text on white format mm-hmm. that you might be familiar with if you've read like the white box D and I want to get into the art real fast. Some of it is like good comic book style, but the other is this really gorgeous like line art. It's really, yeah, really good. It's, this yeah. is well produced. All right. I'm looking at the, uh, the attributes. It's got your, what you would expect from an old school game. It's got your six stats, which one are one page character sheet. Yep. Martial skills, your expertise, which I guess is a modifier plus checks. Oh, there's a secret. There's a secret on that. So, you know, when we were talking in, I think it was, I think we were talking in sneakers about the concept of merits and flaws. Yeah, yeah. And how I'd mentioned that, well, I found that going back all the way, at least into the early 80s, this is the game that I was talking about. You get, uh, oh, a, right, you right, get right. A merit, I think it's going to merit, you get something in a secret. Mm-hmm. You, uh, it's right before the secret section. The, the word is flipping me. I passed you my copy. I'm sorry. I'll pass it back in just a second. But what they've gone into for France at the time is is fairly in depth. Oh, yeah. Unlike All for One, fully half of Flashing Blades is dedicated to the setting. No, this is good. There are and details on military ranks, campaigns, adventures. intrigue within the nobility, breakdowns on the life in the regions, maps of the cities, political overviews of the land, and best yet, Multiple complete adventures. No, the, no, I'm I'm in the adventures now. Hey, uh, voters, Matthew wants to play this. <laughs> and I do there's, too. There is also uh, looks like there's an expansion for it or a secondary. There's, there there's, are uh, four or five oh, okay. complete campaign expansions the for it. Parisian adventures. Parisian. 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 Excuse me. Thank you, Scott. Excuse me. Sorry. <laughs> Excuse me. Uh, that looks. I'm looking at the PDF right now. Uh, that's online, and it it is. It, it looks great also. And for those with a more piratey vein, they actually have Flashing Blades High Seas. Yep. Which has a couple of adventures and uh, some ship stuff. All right. I want to say two things. One, I didn't bring up Palladium this time. And I expect <laughs> to hear about that in the comment section below. I think Palladium two. will enter every episode in some way or another. <laughs> Palladium Probably. enters Palladium. everything. Two. I really want to play this game. Uh, this looks fascinating. Uh, it looks enough because I'm I'm an old school D and D player, um, and I, I like a certain amount on my character sheet. Um, and this has just enough. I, I I really and I I love the setting. I love what they went into on the setting. I didn't read just skimmed real fast, but this looks this looks amazing. And I think you made the right call on this. So that whole females in the characters thing from all for one flashing blades does include statements on female characters but unlike all for one the writer never straight up tells you what you must do right right from the start of its related bit of text it says everything is up to the gm it encourages players to break with historical accuracy to maximize group fun i was impressed with the delicacy with which especially from the 80s especially from the 80s with which he approached the subject and I find it that a little shameful that something published in 2010 was less socially aware than a book published in 1984. Yeah, I mean, I'm not a huge fan of, like, over-the-top PC culture, but just saying that women can't... No. 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 Shut up. Yeah. I'm, I completely agree. Yeah. And and uh, for those of you interested in seeing how a woman is, might be portrayed, there is a movie called D'Artagnan's Daughter. It's a French movie. Let's look it up. Huh. Interesting. I I'm, haven't gone that far. Thank you. Never heard of that one. I would I've, love to see it. Yeah, I've watched I'll check lots it out. of. I've watched lots of dreamless <laughs> films. <laughs> I had mistakenly thought you had a tattoo of it on the other arm, but it was just the uh, Dr. Pepper. <laughs> <laughs> Mistaken so tattoos. the combat in this. So 
I really want to run this game. And I really, I doubt that it will win because, well, who knows? You guys will surprise me. I'm really surprised at what's happening in our current voting. Yeah. But I really want to run this game for its sheer simplicity. The combat in it is something that I've only ever seen done recently. I did not know that this technique went that far back. All right, let's run it real fast. Every round of combat, you write down your action, your planned action. So to start a combat, you write down, I'm going to do this, this, and this. Everybody writes it down at the same time, and then you reveal what you're doing. Okay, so the DM sets the scene, yep. and everyone reacts to that by writing something down and handing it in? Well, they write it down, uh-huh. and then everybody, right, cool, reveal your actions. Okay. When you've done that, so then every round of combat flows in the same order. Uh, it starts with movement, and it goes through the quicker things into the slower things. So movement always happens first, and I think, like, pole arms happen last or something. Right. So everything happens in a certain flow. This was pretty common back in the day when more games were based off of war gaming rules. Uh-huh. I actually like that idea because nobody rolls initiative anymore. Everything is based on what you're doing, and that's when it determines what happens. Yeah. And if there's a tie, your dex breaks the tie. Didn't D&D have, like, a speed factor for a while? In second ed, it mm-hmm. second did. Second ed, yeah. yeah. But in earlier editions, it had uh, phases, like the movement phase, the archery phase, and the melee phase. Yeah, and then in later, it was just what you were saying a earlier. A 30-second yeah. scene could take five hours of your afternoon. God, right? Back in the day, it was pretty quick. Well, I mean, we all cut our teeth on that, yeah. so... Anyway, but with this, you state an action, and you you have two actions. I don't think you can take the same action twice. I, I, I didn't read it in depth. i got to give it another reread if we're going to run it. But you got two actions, and sometimes you have short actions, sometimes you have long actions. And long actions can take more than one action, or mm-hmm. more than one round. But with when you state your actions, one of the actions that you can state is your chosen form of defense, like a dodge a sidestep, a lunge back, a parry, all different kind of things. So what, when, when you're handing in your piece of paper, what, what kind of things are you writing down? Because there's a, you write a, your, a movement. Yeah. You write if you're moving. Uh-huh. You write your form of attack, and you right. write your defense. Okay. It, it's, there's a little bit more nuance to it than that, but the, I was reading through the example of combat, and it's essentially every round the... Combatants in the example were like one attack and one defense. Just, just the doing. people who are going to vote on this, I would like to state that right now I have like a stack of 6,000 post it notes, so that's not going to be a problem. <laughs> if you choose you don't actually to vote need to way. pass it into the DM, you just oh, write it down right. and flip it over when you're done. So your form of attack and your opponent's form of defense affect each other. So if you lunge and they sidestep, well, unfortunately, uh, their cho- their decision to sidestep oh, gives you a negative six penalty this to your done, lunge. And this is what... So no dice have happened yet. No dice have happened yet. Okay. We arrange, figure out what everybody's doing, and then we resolve it uh-huh. in order of whatever's oh, happening. Oh, I like that. So they're right. Okay, D'Artagnan, you're lunging. <laughs> but Rochefort has chosen to sidestep. So you have a minus six to your attack. And now I roll. And now you roll. That's interesting. Yeah. I like that I because like that it's, it's not just a static modifier. It's a modifier on how well you can envision the situation that's happening. Mm-hmm. That's you have to, very you have interesting. To get ahead of the person. Yeah. So the most recent game that I've seen do something like that is called Burning Wheel. You could probably actually do Musketeers and Burning Wheel. Yeah. It would be a really emotionally intense kind of game because that's what Burning Wheel creates characters for. Mm-hmm. But Burning Wheel has this beat-by-beat combat system where you plan three actions ahead. Uh-huh. And then, so you plan three and they plan three, and then you resolve them side-by-side side and see which one happened. I have a little decks of cards for that. Yeah, the cards are really cool. Uh, with, I wouldn't do Burning Wheel for this. It would take too <laughs> long to play, <laughs> and our readers would get bored. Our readers, our listeners would get bored. This is all word-to-text right now. You're, we're just typing it. But this kind of scripted action i love i love seeing it in such a simple game other I, than that it's actually again it's simple you roll a d20 you compare it to a number <gasps> you want to roll low okay okay lower the better now Always. is is this okay. game Across still available on like can you still this buy it this game is still in publication oh really? good okay. the original version you can still order new like copies like a hard copy from their website yeah, awesome. that's nice 
Interesting. That so you, is, could, you could probably trip down to your friendly that local gaming store. That kind of blew my mind it. when I discovered it. Yeah. yeah. Probably not at your friendly local gaming store. Uh-huh. It might be. You can also get PDFs of all of them on drive through. Yeah. 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 So we want to talk campaign and how to play this in an extended play. Well, we've got source books that Dusty mm-hmm. found on their website. Yep. We've got at least four or five of them that can extend the game in different ways. There are a number of included adventures in the box that you can just start out with. And the first of those adventures, the very first one in the book, is the good old-fashioned bar brawl. That's Why all that's, it is. That's where you Big start. Fan. That's where you start with the bar brawl. Bar it's brawl. either that or rats. It's almost yeah. as if this guy was a gamer and wrote a product <laughs> for gamers, <laughs> knowing exactly how gamers would play his game. You always start at like, the crossed sabers in or the dual yeah. dagger in, and there's always the, the GM's head. Thro- yeah, the GM throws a brawl just so you guys can get used to fighting, and then yeah. that's your hook. What I would do if I were going to run this is I would actually start the game exactly how the movie starts. L- like it's a freaking RPG already. Here you go, son. And, and really yeah. Here is your again. sword. Gold. Here is your horse. <laughs> yeah. Here is your 15 golds. Go forth and be a hero. Yeah. It was just, get here into is f- your father's. I, 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 I mean, think he like, said, get, get into fights. Go get your yeah, fights, yeah. my boy. Make sure you duel. You can almost hear the <laughs> bidu, 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 music <laughs> kick in, and suddenly you're wandering into the countryside, and <laughs> fight scene mm-hmm. breaks out with Rochefort. Yeah. Rochefort uses humiliate. It's very effective. <laughs> fight over. <laughs> <laughs> so you could start that way. The movie just gives you a... It's so gameable right there. But if you want more ideas than that are in the books themselves, watch the freaking TV show. What I love about the show which I've mentioned this several times tonight, is it's entirely episodic. Every episode is a complete adventure. Uh Each one. And if you go to the Wikipedia page, well, the Wikia, what I love about it is you don't even have to watch the episodes. You can go to the Wikia and just look at the simple episode summaries. I'm going to read a couple of The Adventure of the Week? Yeah, the first one. The first episode. Does it have an... I'm sorry, does it have an over... Arcing plot structure, though, or is each one separate? It's the overarching plot st- structure is musketeers defending the king versus the machinations of Richelieu. So there's uh, so there's not a, a a build or it roughly follows the musketeer stuff, mm-hmm. but there's you know and the characters have their own arcs in right. it, but it's not like you don't have to watch it back to back. You can okay sit down and watch an episode. Um, just real quick for the listeners, if they are running to run it, where where are you right now reading? This so they they can I just got this from the Musketeers of Wikia. So okay. Wikia is a fan run community website where anybody can create mm-hmm. their own private do well their own subdomain of any fandom in the universe. For example, there's the Wikipedia, which yeah, is the Star Wikia, Wars, yeah. About Star Wars. I like that and one up yeah, there. So the Memory Alpha is one. Mm-hmm. Uh, there, there's a number of them. All right. First episode synopsis. Young Swordsman D'Artagnan and his father are on their way to Paris to petition the king when they are attacked in an inn. And D'Artagnan's father is killed, naming Athos as the killer before dying. While the young man seeks vengeance from his father's death, musketeers Aramis and Porthos must clear their friend Athos's name before he's executed before a firing squad at dawn. Can they sway the king's opinion before it's too late? Congratulations, you have an adventure right there. Yeah, yeah you do. That is very much... Yeah. The module of the of the weekend for you, for you and, and your each friends. Each of these descriptions follows that blah 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 blah. Can they blah blah blah? Question mark in the right. whole Rocky and Bullwinkle style episode conclusion. I yeah. like it. I yeah. like it. Yeah. yeah. No, because oh, I love the mu- the Musketeer show. While not not, not not accurately adhering to the books, is a really good show. It captures the spirit. I felt the same way about Sherlock. And the first time you meet Porthos, mm-hmm. Barbara. Of course. Yeah. I mean, that's Porthos. God, not to drag it back to the movie, but I love that scene. I love, yeah. Where he's he's fighting one at noon, one at one, one at two. Oh, I know. (laughs) Yeah. That was fantastic. Yeah. Oh, and D'Artagnan's face is he's like, yeah, uh, uh, yeah, I got it. We're good. (laughs) Calculating when he's fighting who at Uh what time. (laughs) Like, in this, if if I was running it, I would do um, a, a long campaign, but. I noticed something in the movie which wasn't in my original thought as to how to run it as a campaign. Please and that me. was he lost his father's sword. Oh, immediately. Yeah. They just yeah, they just cut up and immediately. Did not so see that what coming. if his father's sword showed up in a body? Ooh. 
And then young D'Artagnan, with his new friends, had to clear his name. The cardinal is, of course, trying to get rid of the musketeers. That's what he, he doesn't want the king and the queen to have their own power base. Uh-huh. Um, so what he did was in the rubbish heap, one of his creatures found this ancient musketeer sword, shoved it into someone important. Mm-hmm. And I mean, cause it's, it's discarded. Like he, he lost his father's sword without even blinking twice. He was like, Oh, new sword. Sweet. And all of a sudden that comes back to haunt him. He's trying to start this new career in the Musketeers immediately after the movie, but the next play from the Cardinal is to immediately discredit this new Musketeer that had vexed him by framing him for a murder, and that's how I'd personally start it out. So aside from this new novel, The Red Stinks, that just came out, for the longest time, there was nothing between The Three Musketeers and the sequel 20 years after. That's 20 years in which you have... Free, if you want to play the Musketeers or variations of those characters, that, that's 20 years to play around with and still keep the canon of the books, if you want, or whatever. Yeah. You know, it's all there. There's, yeah. actually, there's actually a mystery novelist. Uh, I, I don't know what her name is off the top of my head, who has written a couple of, at least one Musketeer mystery novel um, that takes place, uh, you know, during that time period. Where they're trying to just to, to find stuff. As long as you want to, if you want to stick with the canon, yeah, that's totally fine. I think the main established things are you can't kill Richelieu. Yeah, yeah, he's yeah. He's, yeah. he's an yeah. excellent foil. I like, I really like the Duke Buckingham. I think he'd create a great alternate patron for adventures. Not only that, he would create a great alternate villain. They have mutual yeah. respect, or yep. not not villain uh, antagonist. <clears throat> they have mutual respect. But, I mean, let's face it, France and England, they yeah. got a bit of a history. Yeah, just, just like mean, he said, you know, it, <laughs> yeah. when he was stepping out, it's, uh, we're at war, you know, we, we're, yeah. we're at war, which are, we're enemies, so I bid you good day. Yeah, that would be a very interesting final arc, is the war with England, if, if you Ooh, wanted to do this as a campaign. Yeah. Because you're yeah. facing people you admire, people you know, people that you've probably helped back and forth over the course of this campaign, but all of a sudden... Due to your foppish king, and if their, I recall my history, their foppish king yes. at the time. Um, Jamie will correct us. Yeah, Jamie will correct us. <laughs> All right, Jamie. You're, you're at war. So it would be the fight of good men and ladies, because we're not playing that game, defending the honor of their nations and trying to be honorable in a dishonorable war. And I think that would bring an excellent thing to the table. Yeah, that, that works totally well, except for the Duke of Buckingham actually dies. Oh. You only saw the first movie. He dies in the second movie. That's right. It's a major plot I haven't point. I have since I was a child. But, but, and I haven't but read war, the, book the war since. with England would still, could but still be. Yeah. And I haven't but, read the book since what, freshman year in high school. We're, we're messing around with history. So, if we're going to you know, break with canon, we could yeah. easily escalate him as a mysterious figure, an yeah. unknown force who may be an ally. Does he die? Did villain. anyone see the body? And if you <laughs> definitely want to break there with you canon, you could even have the Musketeers, your characters, working for the Duke in some clandestine way and accidentally kick off full-on war between England and France. Wouldn't that be freaking That'd be cool? Good. I want to play this game, but we can't do it in a gaming session. So. Nope. That's not one gaming session. Yeah. But no, 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 no. I, I could see a fascinating that's a long multi year yeah. campaign being built in this. So world. if we really want to break with the whole gender roles, so let's just make the musketeers, you know, men and women. Yeah. They serve both the king and the queen. So yeah. why not? Yeah. So it makes sense to me. In twenty in twenty years after, they actually do get involved in a war, but it's the English Civil War. Right. Mm-hmm. And they try to save King Charles, which well, of I, course I, they don't, but I'd say we, uh, I'd say we have a winner then. That's that's a solid game. Flashing and blades. Flashing yeah. blades. So, um, um, anyone else? Anyone else got anything before we close this out? I'm looking because <laughs> I, I, I think I think we got a solid here. I think we have uh, the 1973 <laughs> version of Three yes. Musketeers, which yes. is a great movie. I highly recommend everyone watching it. And we have Flashing Blades as the game to play it in. It's a game of choice. Yeah. So go that's go get right. a bucket of popcorn. Watch it and then go find a game master and play the damn game. Now you yeah. could probably pick this movie up for real cheap, and if you're I think it's only like two ninety nine on Amazon right yeah, now. Yeah, and it, and if you uh, if you have access to a good gaming shop like we do here in Portland, uh, you can probably pick up a used copy somewhere of Flashing Blades. If not, 
Just pick it up on I Amazon. I didn't even think to go there and look. I was going to order an to Amazon. Guardian. Yeah, yeah sure. I, yeah, I, I don't think Guardian do does, but uh, Powell's actually might also have one. Yeah, I'll, I'll, they I'll have a big could. Yeah. section. Yeah, Powell's uh, Portland's local Amazon. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> seriously for books. That's yeah, yeah, yeah. This was Three Musketeers, Flashing Blades. I was Matthew, and I'm Dusty. And I'm Nathaniel, and uh, once again, I want to welcome our very special guest. And I'm Scott, and I want to thank <laughs> I want to thank Matthew, Dusty, and Nathaniel for having me over for this episode. Yeah, this is, a lot this of fun. is great. Thank you. Thanks for coming on board. All right, thanks for tuning in, guys. We'll see you next week. See you next week. Thanks for listening to another episode of our show. We're a new name in the enormous sea of podcasts, and appreciate any feedback that you can send our way. If you like what you've heard. Or even if you didn't, please leave us a review and let us know. Got a movie or a game that you want to hear us talk about? Drop us a comment on our website at havemovieswillgame.com or hit us up on any of the usual social networks. We'd love to hear from you. The opening theme music is Rock and Gravel by Sid Valentine's Patent Leather Kids, part of the public domain and found on publicdomain4u.com. Opening narration is provided by Isaac Scher. Half Movies Will Game is distributed under Creative Commons Attribution Non-Commercial No Derivatives. Thanks for listening, and we'll catch you again next week. <laughs>